All right, good evening, everyone. So welcome to our PVSD board meeting. Um, we do have translation available in Spanish. Uh, so if you need that support, please see Orania Lopez. So tenemos traducción en español. Si necesita de este servicio, por favor, pase con Orania Lopez. Um, if someone would like to speak to an item that is on our agenda, um, please fill out a speaker card uh, and hand it to Eva Renteria prior to the start of the agenda item. Each speaker will have two minutes. So um, we'll go on to our Pledge of Allegiance, and I would like to ask our interim superintendent to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Well, I could do that. Right. Please stand, place your hand over your heart, and begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. Thank you. And then we will move on to item 3.3, our interim superintendent comments. Wow. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome. If you don't know who I am, my name is Marie Sheckman, and I'm about as happy as anybody to be here at a board meeting sitting in this seat. I want to thank the board um, for the wonderful reception, a 7-0 vote. I want to plant seeds that that's the way to go. When we get 7-0 votes, and I said this 12 years ago as an assistant, and when we get 7-0 votes, it means that the board is compromising, is moderating, is working together. The bond is the best example. So I thank you. I thank this community. I have, I have been blown away, quite honestly, using a youthful vernacular at how welcoming everyone has been. I really appreciate it from kids who are now grandparents, kids of mine from EA Hall in the early 80s, the office manager at McQuitty. Oh my goodness, she was my student a long time ago and um, even a young man, well he's not so young now, a, a gentleman who said I suspended him but it was a good time, which is why we don't want to do the suspensions. But thank you to the community. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to be back. It's been a sentimental journey and I appreciate it couple other things I do want to report on. Um, thank you, Cabinet. I am blessed with brilliant people. I was unaware. I knew how important Cabinet would be to the superintendent or interim superintendent. Didn't know. And they're good. They're dedicated. They're really smart. And, you know, Casey, he's leaving. I've tried to keep him here. He, he well, we have some things to say about Casey in a little bit. We have a breakfast on August 14th for the, all the faculty, all our employees. Sometimes we've had a good crowd in the past. It's at PV High. I want to have as many people who are willing to be there. I really hope we have a good crowd. We, we usually buy breakfast. It costs 5000 It's a good deal. I decided that it would be appropriate to see, because the community's been so sweet and there's a little momentum going on, I decided to basically call in some chips. We have it all covered from the community. We've raised over $5,000. We have De La Colmena giving us $250 in burritos. All three Rotary Clubs, Granite Rock, Driscoll's, the Chamber, um, uh, employees at KBK, John Skillicorn Real Estate, Melvin Cooper, who owns three of the auto dealerships. Quite honestly, they were happy because they want us to succeed. They want teachers and our classified staff to feel supported and um, it, was, it was part of uh, the pleasure in coming back. Um, you'll hear a little more, or you already read about a wonderful grant that we just got. A few challenges, not going to go into them now, but testing, our budget, and enrollment are things that I am looking forward to focusing on. And now I'd like to uh, ask Casey to just stand pretty please. Casey is as kind a leader as we have in this district.
report. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we'll move on to 3.4, our governing board comments. And this is our opportunity for each board member to make a few comments. And we'll start with uh, Trustee Flores. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you to everyone for being out here tonight. Um, I don't have a whole lot to say uh, for the last couple weeks. We, I didn't have any meetings to attend. Um, I have been keeping an eye on some of the campuses near um, my district um, and seeing many of the improvements that are going on. And I'm happy to, you know, see that our students are going to be welcomed back to improved campuses. Um, I do want to keep an eye on on that part. And thank you, Herlindo and, and MNO, for everything that they're doing to clean up our campuses and prepare them for our students. Vice President Acosta. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I don't have um, any um, com standing committee reports either. Um, I have been seeing a lot of work as is no normal at this time of season um, through our MNO department and I just really want to give a big shout out to Herlindo and all his team out there and all the work they're doing. I, I agree with Trustee Flores. I think our students, our faculty and staff are going to return to some really um, nice campuses with some improvements along the way. Um, and other than that, because it's the first time I can formally do it in public, I, I just want to welcome our interim superintendent, Mr. Murray Sh um, Sheckman, to our district. Did have one committee meeting with him this last week um, for agenda setting committee, and he handled that very well, um, being new to board docs and all of that. So um, I just want to formally you, say welcome. It is our pleasure to have you here. Um, I'm also want to echo your th sentiments on that 7-0 vote. I totally agree with you, and you couldn't have said it better. So welcome, and I think we're in for a good start to this school year. So thank you. Thank you. Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you, and happy almost August. I can't believe how fast the summer is flying by. I want to welcome um, a our assistant superintendent, Murray Sheckman. We have spent a lot of years together in this boardroom and I'm very happy to have you at the helm. So welcome back, Murray. Um, I did attend a Pajaro um, a PVPSA uh, board meeting and at our agenda setting and look forward to uh, the school year opening up. We'll be attending the breakfast and enjoy the rest of your summer, everybody. Trustee Soto. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, just want to reiterate everybody else's comments. Murray, thank you for uh, stepping up and taking on the position. And uh, you know, take us in a in a proper direction. So thank you for doing that. Um, I got an update regarding Pajaro Middle on the progress of the uh, reconstruction there post flood. Um, a lot of good stuff happening, so Hurley, thank you, thank your staff, and all the guys working hard. Uh, I know you've got subs out there as well that are doing stuff, so keep up the good work. Um, yeah, there's a there's a different vibe in the district. You can kind of feel it. I felt it in in the uh, closed session meeting too. So uh, there's a lot of positive feelings. So that's good. So thank you, everybody. Trustee Scott. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody, and to everybody watching us on YouTube. Uh, very excited to welcome our superintendent, interim superintendent, our superintendent, Murray Sheckman, and thank him for stepping up. Um, and thank my board colleagues for uh, the work we've done together in the past, not just the past month, but the past four or five months since I've had the pleasure to serve, um, giving our raises to our administrators, to our teachers, uh, we've done some good work together, and, and I think it's really exciting to bring on somebody with his depth of experience as a teacher, a principal, counselor, somebody who's trained so many people, administrators in our region. Uh, we're pretty lucky to have him. So um, thanks again, Murray. Um, and, you know, it's because we have somebody like him who offers our district so much that I really feel good about um, where we are as a district, also on recent history where we've come and um, I feel uh, uh, excited about all the work we're going to be doing and talking about some of the things on the agenda tonight. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. And um, 
I'll, I'll echo my colleagues' welcome uh, statements, and it's, uh, your, your work is much appreciated. Um, I also want to mention some uh, donations that are you know, in our consent agenda, but I just wanted to highlight them because they're, they're uh, exemplary of you know, our community. And the final pledge donation for the Culinary Garden Teaching Kitchen at Starlight Elementary has been received. And this was a $5,000 um, donation from Dr. Jackie Medina and family. And that closes out the fund development campaign that raised a total of $1,534,140 from our community of 163 supporters that included individuals, businesses, foundations, government, and nonprofit partners. This program will continue to generate meaningful learning and teaching experiences not just for our Starlight community, but across the district through deep connection with our garden-based education partners at Life Lab. If you haven't seen this garden yet, I, I strongly recommend it. We thank Dr. Medina for her leadership of this special project during the planning, building, and implementation phases. And I also want to um, thank Driscoll's Corp. They donated $150,000 to renovate and upgraded, upgrade uh, Watsonville High School's soccer field alongside uh, Blackburn Street. And I continue to be most appreciative of this community's support for our students. For myself, this coming August is a special milestone for me. Um, my oldest started kinder at Rio Del Mar Elementary in fall of 2003. So, and my youngest is a sophomore at Aptos uh, High. So this marks my 20th consecutive year of being a PBUSD parent. And I know that my children's lives have been profoundly affected by the teachers, the staff, and administrators of this district. And I am profoundly grateful. I think about how far we've come. I remember being so sad at the lack of access to arts and music that I remember having, you know, when I was a child. And while there is still progress to be made, we have come so far. I think about the developments in our CTE and ethnic studies curriculum. How amazing is it that our students can meet the requirements in areas that spark their interests? You know, who knows what further opportunities these programs will bring about. Anyway, I just wanted to acknowledge the work that so many people have done to make PVOSD a district to be proud of, so thank you. All right, so we will go on to item 4.1, approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? I make a motion to approve the agenda. We have a motion. I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Um, and item 5.1, approval of the July 12th, 2023 board meeting minutes. And I'll make a motion to approve, but I, I, there was a question about the start time of the meeting. And I think that we started, I think we had quorum right at six o'clock. So that we, just with that, okay. If, if I'm remembering correctly. On, on the 12th, the last one. Yeah, because we went into the closer. Yeah, yeah, right away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. All right. <coughs> any opposed? Motion carries 6-0. We don't have any uh, public hearings. Um, so item 7.1, public comment. So this is our opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for the evening. And just as a reminder, you know, if, if you're new, we, we can't engage in discussion back and forth, but know that we are listening to what you have to say. Do we have any public comments? Yes, we do. We have four speakers, and I'll call you up um, by twos. And um, if you could come up in that order, that'd be great. And just as a reminder to what uh, President um, Trustee Dr. Holm said earlier, to reiterate, it's a two-minute timing for each um, speaker. Um, Elaine Legorieta and Carrie Gill are our first two. There we go. Fixed it. <laughs> Is, okay, I'm, I'm echoing, so I hear it. Okay. I have some thoughts. 
call them strong suggestions, as you consider who to hire as our next superintendent. As efforts for increasing salaries continue, it is cr critical to also put effort into the human culture of a school district. We have adopted numerous programs to address student attendant achievement and have not seen the growth needed. I contend that employee retention is an overlooked piece for increased student att achievement. Based on my experience and listening to others, here are some qualities that will help us to retain and further develop the talent of our employees. Focus on people. See and value the person, not just the job. Trust staff. Respect the skills they bring and leadership they can provide at whatever level of the system they work. Be a good listener. Respect input from the trenches. It is important that struggles be sh safely shared as well as successes. Build rapport so people feel safe. Our next superintendent needs the skill to generate that safety of conversation and sharing up the ladder. Demonstrate respect for leaders and staff with collaborative practices and meetings. Nurture a comfort to be creative. Be a leader who develops leadership and lets leaders lead. Hold a focus on quality evaluations for affirming quality work and identifying needed growth. Lastly, cynicism of professional development is rampant. Not because the providers aren't skilled, but because the content is frequently not relevant or differentiated to the growth needs of our professionals. TOSAs, other coaches, and site departments or grade levels have stayed stuck in the basics of onboarding to programs. Minimal employee loss in all departments allows for veterans to wrap around new staff to accelerate onboarding to the team. It also allows for deepening of excellence in practice with a greater variety of professional development. Thank you very much. Everything she just said. Um, <laughs> my name is Carrie Gell. I'm a Mar Vista parent, and I'm also a teacher at Aptos Junior. Um, I was the PBIS uh, coordinator up until this year. The PBIS initiative that the district rolled out four years ago is going to fail if you don't support it. Um, every year, we're expected to grow and meet a new level of behavior supports on each campus, but each year, the district removes more support for the program. Our first year, I was the PBIS coordinator. I received a stipend. Last year, that stipend was removed, and I was asked to keep a timesheet of my hours working on PBIS up to a certain amount, which was the stipend amount. It seemed to be a slight slap in the face or a lack of trust that I was doing my job. Um, now this year, we have no district finances or stipend for a PBIS coordinator, and the funding must come out of site budgets. Being the PBIS coordinator is a big job. I ran the school's social media accounts. I designed assemblies to focus on behavior, expectations, and how to treat other people. PBIS coordinators are expected to organize and shop for incentives for behavior, and on our campus, that includes a student of the month recognition for both grade levels, a monthly no tardy party for students with zero tardies, a PBIS store where they can spend their five star points, as well as a bi monthly wheel spin where they can spend five star points on incentives. In addition, we have monthly PBIS meetings we can barely fit in amongst all the other required PD and meetings. They usually got, you know, that was the first thing to go. We're responsible for developing signage around campus and making sure we are hitting our marks on our annual TFI to submit for our PBIS recognition. It's not a small job that you will get a teacher to do for free. Um, in fact, it could be another FTE for each site. There is so much that we could get done with a dedicated PBIS coordinator. But as with most programs in this district, it is receiving less support every year while maintaining the same expectations. Another concern related that I would like to bring to you is safety on campus. Last year, Aptos Junior had an additional campus security person for the last part of the school year. It was wonderful. This made a significant impact to our campus security in a positive way. I encourage you to find more ways to support additional adult supervision on our campuses for student safety. Thank you. <laughs> and our next two, um, none other than our honorable mayor, Edward Eduardo Montesino and Chris Webb. Good evening. Um, uh, Eduardo Montesino, the mayor of the city of Watson, but more importantly, I'm a parent. Um, and it's my, my last uh, child is enrolled in Rolling Hills. Um, but this district has a lot of potential. And I want to welcome Murray for coming back and, and, and giving us the help that we need to uh, find a, a, a steady leader for the future. But that's uh, what I want to talk to you about. You know, um, 
uh, like Ms. Legreta just said very eloquently, um, uh, we need, you know, a support for retention. We, uh, we become a training ground. Um, we, uh, we want the district to be able to grow and foster. And this is a, this is a, a great opportunity to all, uh, all of us to work together. Like Murray said, seven. We need seven to steer our ship. Um, seven in a community because this is a growing community. And I just, you know, I just w wanna highlight, I just came um, from Salinas from an event for um, <coughs> a new speaker, uh, Mr. Rivas, rural community, you know, public school schools. We have a lot of potential in our community. Let's work together to achieve and get more speakers for our community because he, he's the highlight of, uh, of, of rural communities. And we can do that here in this district if we work together. Work together to make create goals. And, um, and I just want to offer anything we can help um, along the city. I already contacted Mr. Uh, Shackman, uh, Murray Shackman. Um, um, we're, we're, we're there with all of you. So thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'd like to, to welcome you as well, uh, Assistant Superintendent. Uh, I'm Chris Webb. I'm from Renaissance High School. I started teaching there in 2015, and um, I came from a more traditional school. And then when I when I arrived, I, I carried a lot of the same practices and like expectations. And one of the things I heard originally, and we're going over like Shag. Stanford History Education Group, some primary source document or something. Or I would say something like, oh, we're not going to leave until we, you know, like I'd said certain basic expectations, your first day of school type stuff. And one of the things I heard from the students was like, oh, you need to go to Optos. This is Renaissance. We don't do that. And then um, like in the next couple of years, like as I acculturated to Renaissance, um, like I discovered like actually we had like a really strong program and we were really good at getting students to realize their potential. We had huge turnarounds in attendance. Somebody would leave Watsonville with like a 40% attendance and then they come here and they go through our entry program, they acculturate, they get the expectations that are clearly laid out and supported and then they wind up at, you know, like part of our 90 plus attendance rate. I wanna get back to that. I wanna, last year, um, teachers at my site um, took into heart um, feedback they received from, from their uh, higher authorities at multiple levels to refine that PBIS system in line with the criticism they heard. And then we never got it off the ground. It was like we prepared everything and then they didn't want to drive the car. So, and, the, and in the end, the teachers were in like silos. And that's a really hard way to go through a year. And I don't think it serves anyone. I feel like if we keep that, we're going to have like low morale. We're going to have low attendance. We're going to have lost opportunities for students. That killed me because I was one of the people who was connecting with some of these outside groups on a, on a personal level. I know them from my, my rugby life. And then I come here and my school didn't get to go because we didn't have the behavior culture set up and our principal was nervous about them going out and then other sites were doing it and other sites had those supports. So I'd like to get back to those supports that work so well. 2018 WASP, recognize them. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Any other public comments? That is all. All right. So we'll go on to our employee organizations. So this is the time where we hear from our employee organizations, and we'll start with PVFP. Good evening, board and um, interim superintendent, Mr. Sheckman. Um, I got here just in time. Apparently you all are flying through this agenda already. Um, <laughs> what am I gonna say? Um, other than two more weeks? <laughs> I, again, like I mentioned this last um, time that we had a board meeting, Human Resources, I checked in with them on what our vacancies are looking like um, and they have really been doing a stellar job in filling vacancies. As of today, from what I gathered from the HR analysts, um, there are 20, which, wow. Um, yay. I don't, they're not here. Um, <laughs> so, and we still have, um, you know, people are still being contacted to, to um, 
you know, take on a contract or not. But I, I wanted to say thank you to approving that um, raise that we negotiated because I really believe that that's been very, very helpful. So that coupled with the amazing health benefits that we also negotiate um, for the um, for all of us employees, all of us stakeholders here in the district, that has definitely helped with putting us back into the um, sight lines of many people who are coming into education or even returning. I met a returning um, colleague uh, today, so that's wonderful um, to see people returning to our district because they know that the benefits are great, um, but now they see that the salary schedule is ca catching up. Um, so thank you um, for beginning to make those moves and in investing in the employees in our district. Um, and then as we move forward um, into this coming year, I know in a couple of weeks we have SBC days, and, I, and there are these two voluntary days um, to, to work curriculum, um, the 7th and the 8th, and I think it's a great idea for those the new teachers that are coming in to have that opportunity to come in and to learn about that curriculum. I was at an orientation a couple weeks ago when I first heard about, of, of these voluntary days, and so I was just like, whoa, what's that about? Want to make sure that people are also compensated, <laughs> and they, they are. Um, and one other thing that our um, negotiation team this last cycle negotiated was those optional four days and we are c continually hearing from our members of how grateful they are to have those optional four days um, that they could use uh, at at, uh, on, at their discretion, and you know, in accordance with like working with their director or their administrator, because they're going in and working. Um, some are pursuing to use that, the you know, to get paid their per diem to go to a PD somewhere else that's going to, that they're then going to bring back um, a wonderful skill that they're taking, you know, learning at, um, at, you know, in some training outside of our district. So that is how um, this benefits not only our, our uh, member, the employees here, but our students because they're bringing that here. It's something that is relevant to the work that they do and they're being compensated for their time. Um, because as we all know, um, time is uh, very valuable, and um, and then as I get older and as my family gets older, I, I you know time is um, is there's it's finite, so it's important that our time is valued um, and and it uh, as professionals, um, but also just as people who also dedicate their time to our district. So um, thank you, and um, yeah, I I uh, will. See, speak to you at the next meeting in which we will have people back um, and we'll be back in the uh, full swing of, of the new school year. Thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have anyone here that with us from CSEA? I, I'd just like to note on that that I do believe CSEA has gone away um, at their leadership conference. Ah, okay. Just for a note on sure. that. Um, do we have anyone from Pavam? Good evening, President Holm, Superintendent Sheckman, Board of Trustees, and PVUSD community. Um, it's my privilege to be able to address you tonight um, on behalf of Pavam. My name is Michael Berman. I'm the Director of Equity, State, and Federal Programs and Accountability. Um, we're at the first board meeting of the 23-24 school year, so it's that great time of the year where we can use one of my favorite sayings, which is Happy New Year. Um, we are very excited to be working on quite a few things, and I'm hoping to highlight tonight some of the efforts coming up and um, currently happening to start this year on behalf of Pavam. Um, the first one is our Administrator University. In order to welcome and support our PVUSD administrators who are in their first few years as leaders in their current role, uh, directors and coordinators, many of whom are in the room, are hosting our inaugural Administrators University this week. Um, department leads from HR, student services, MNO, business services, teaching and learning, program evaluation, special services, and us at State and Fed. Um, we're all working closely with our new administrators uh, in thoughtfully designing session, in thoughtfully designed sessions. Um, each topic was selected 
to support the administrator's growth in their positions, um, as well as differentiate the learning to meet the specific needs of those that are new to our district and those who have worked in our district prior. Uh, each session is organized by topic with a focus on, a common, on common challenges, hot tips, and systems and structures to support now and throughout the school year. Um, some of the topics include safety and discipline and positive school cultures, uh, human resources. Lisa came and joined us to discuss leveraging leadership to support effective communication and organization. I got to talk about uh, school plans and school site council and how to utilize school plans as a tool to support student progress. Um, also about parent engagement. Uh, Brooke was there to talk about data and assessments and kind of gave an overview of all of our assessments and the purpose behind them and then also the roles and responsibilities of each administrator um, and how to communicate the results to in improve instruction and then also how to access all of our platforms. Uh, tomorrow we have business services joining us and they're going to be sharing their procedures and best practices and common hiccups um, regarding purchasing, accounting, finance, payroll, and benefits. Um, and then Friday we have special services. Um, they're going to be talking about inclusive practices, special education, staff organization, compliance referrals, and best practices. Um, number two is our new teacher orientation. You heard Nelly mention this. On August 7th and 8th, our newest uh, certificated team members will join us for our second comprehensive new teacher orientation. This is an opportunity um, to support teachers as they begin their, their careers here with us. Um, on day one, it's going to be making sure they have the technology and the access to our platforms that they need. And then also really with a, with a priority in ensuring that they have something actionable for day one, we're really going to be looking at supporting them uh, with building classroom community, best practices in regards to establishing expectations, um, supporting the school's PBIS, um, instructional strategies to support all students. Uh, after lunch with their administrators, they're going to go back and put it into action. And then on day two, they'll have the opp opportunity to break out groups with um, their grade level or content area teams. Um, the third thing is our SBC day. This year, the SBC day will have all of our certificated staff together and we'll be focusing on filling our social emotional um, buckets and launching our year long professional development strands. Um, teachers will have the opportunity to engage in mindful activities, connect with their peers, uh, and focus on health and wellness as we head into the new year. Um, and lastly, I want to um, ask you all to save the date for October 7th. Um, because of popular demand of our parent conferences, um, we realized, hey, wouldn't it be great if we started the year with a, a, th with a nice kickoff? Um, and we are working with special services and migrant ed and food services and we're going to do you know how we do that f that big fab the february annual parent conference we're going to do two this year we're going to do one in the beginning of the year to start the year strong for our families um, and then one later on in the year as well so i hope you can join us on october 7th and um, once again happy new year thank you very much thank you do we, we we have one oh. public speaker to this item, Chris Webb. Um, I have a couple of remarks about collaborating uh, with Pavam and teachers. But before I get to that, I want to just commend um, the district and, and the Pavam members for their, their processes related to um, the superintendent, uh, related to admin um, hiring, including at Renaissance, and related to the budget, I think, in all these areas that, that we've had good processes, and I really appreciated the board and the deliberative um, approach that I feel everyone has taken. Um, as far as collaborating, I, I feel like we should set down a couple core values. One of those being, like, just asking the question: Does this policy or um, does this rule s does this serve the students? Just simply asking that. Sometimes I feel like we make a change, and it doesn't always serve the students. Um, and I kind of spoke to the, to one of the things I meant in my previous comment. Um, also, you know, does it serve the teachers? And one other thing that kind of gets back to why I like that old uh, method pre-COVID is we had due process, and when when we've lost it, um, I feel like students and staff have lost um, equity. So I feel like uh, we need to to value due process, value stakeholder consideration. Um, I think if we, if teachers come back on those first two days and it's like an entire new program and everything and you were planning on setting up things and refining stuff but now you're having to completely retool for the whole year, 
that's that's not great. That's not a great way to start. Um, if we're going to do major changes like that, and a major change like that for Renaissance would be like from grades to from credit variable credits to grades. If we were to make a change like that, we should be talking about that for a long time, and we should never make a change like that without having that support structure that I previously mentioned. If we didn't, we'd be raising the stakes on students without the support. And I'll tell you this, as a teacher, I'm not going to be scapegoated if a student falls through the the openings we set up in the safety net. So thank you. All right. And so do we have anybody from CWA? Not today. All right, moving on to our action items. Um, so for visual and performing arts at the elementary level, we'll have a report from Casey Kloppenbach, uh, our assistant superintendent of elementary education, and Lisa Aguirre, our assistant superintendent of secondary education. Good evening, President Dr. Holm, Board of Trustees, and our interim superintendent, Mr. Sheckman. I'm here tonight. My name is Casey Klappenbach, Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Education with my colleague. Lisa Aguirre, Assistant Superintendent for Secondary Education. And upon your request, we are both happy here to continue our VAPA and release discussion 2.0 to carry on that discussion and to look a little further into the programs that we're offering our students upon our, in our system. And we have added a few visuals to help us see the system, again, that we are providing and in support of our students. So as you can see, the first um, table here, if you just take a look, you'll see our um, elementary sites on the left side. And this is your, oops, I'm going back, I apologize, to 2022-2023, um, the offerings that we um, provided by our sites for release, and you can see on the left side the visual arts, our music, PE, and science. So if you look carefully, you can tell that we provide a variety, right, throughout the different sites in our district within our system. And if you're looking at our visual arts, and that's where we're going to focus, and our music, you can see that we have two sites that we're not providing visual art last year and you also see eight of our sites providing music as a release so these are our release um, programs offered at the site as you look at this year's this upcoming plan which was approved um, earlier um, by the board I want you to take a look again the same table and what you should notice is that we are offering additional instruction in music and nothing has been taken away in the visual arts for our students from that perspective within our system. What I would like to also draw our attention to as we're looking upon the whole system and our offerings for our students, we also have science, right, provided by a release teacher and that has not changed, right? So we're looking at the VAPA piece, the music, and our science all together for a system of consistent instruction for our students. Um, in looking at the table, what we wanted to look at is that it's the offerings that we have for our students that they receive each day. Um, one of the things that you do notice is that there's not consistency across the district, which we are committed to figuring out how we can make it consistent across the district. So if you notice the visual arts from last year to this year, there are, it's still the same where there's two schools that are not students, students will not be receiving that, but they're, and there's um, different than the ones that there were from last year, but it is still the same number of schools. So, as we're looking at next steps, we are bringing, since this is an action item, we have three requests that staff is bringing to you as a board. The first one is to approve um, moving forward with the plan that was approved at a previous board meeting. 
And then looking at the Prop 28 monies that is coming up, that is something that we have discussed as a board um, that's come up. Uh, we want to look at have, developing a template for sites to use so that they can look at the monies that they have um, allocated to them based on state funding and develop a plan with their own community to decide what's best for their school. And so lastly, that third one is we know that we have some inconsistencies in our district, right, for our students. And so we want to work on a long-term strategic plan and vision for providing not only the VAPA piece, right, music and science to make sure that we are um, supporting our students, right, to have that consistency across the district so it doesn't matter what school you're attending, this would be your program. And so as you're looking at that in the future, we would like to um, form a specialty committee to develop this strategic plan. One of the things that have come into um, play is looking at visual arts versus music. Um, just today, I had a principal um, come up and talk to me about, well, my community actually wants drama and we want theater. So as we've, there's been different um, folks have come and speak and we have our thoughts, board has thoughts, um, different um, community members has thoughts, but at the same time, uh, through the Prop 28, the templates, and also speaking with individual sites, they also have thoughts that we haven't necessarily come into play and heard from their community. So like I said, drama was not something any of us had even, even talked about in all of our conversations, but yet that is something that is a priority of one of our elementary schools. So coming together and building a community where we have experts in, different, in a variety of positions will help develop a PVUSD long-term five-year plan that incorporates many um, voices um, including parents and, um, and families. So staff requests that your approval for the three items that we just brought up and we'll open up for discussion. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. We have 13 and I'll call you up by three if you could come up in that order. And again, to reiterate, each speaker has two minutes. And also, if I do mispronounce your name, please do feel free to correct me. Um, Rebecca Steinberg, Stephanie Tran, and is it Katie or Callie Simpson? Okay. Um, good evening. My name is Rebecca Steinberg, and I have been an art teacher in the district for a while, and I've taught at three different school sites, elementary school sites. And looking at the graph, I just wanted to help you build um, some background knowledge of what my day is like as an art teacher. So I usually see um, five to six classes a day. So over a week, I see approximately 500 students. And one of the solutions that this district has come up with is that I should be split between two schools. So if you think about seeing 500 students a week and the prep time that goes into that, the supplies that are moved in and out, I'm not sure how it would work um, being based out of two different schools. Art is such an important subject. And a specialist really can bring that to life. There, there is no wrong answers in art. Every child in art is successful. It doesn't matter if you speak the language or not. Art is a way of expressing yourself. We think about the importance of art therapy. A lot of our students coming off the pandemic need art as a way to express themselves. They are still struggling with the emotional toll that the pandemic has taken and art is a way to express the good and the bad. I grew up in a family of artists, and I've had a lot of opportunities that I know my students have not had. They have not been able to go to go, excuse me, to go to the museums and the galleries and just explore. I have um, I have been able to open up my classrooms at lunch. Students who don't feel safe on the playground, I invite them. They come. My classrooms are full. Students really, really want to find a safe place, and art gives them that. If they're a struggling reader, they don't want to go to the library. They want to come to the art room. I've had students tell me when we do art projects and they get messy, 
this is the best day ever. And just last note from what one of the assistant superintendents you told me when I worked in minutes. the Central Valley. Doesn't matter how good that your lesson is if you're teaching to an empty chair. <laughs> Scared to touch it. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, first time here. Um, my name is Stephanie Tran. I'm a math instructor at Cabrillo College. I've been teaching college math for 20 years, including the calculus series. My two children attend Mar Vista Elementary School. Art is important because the exposure to art in a student's early years are the foundation for ideas in higher education <coughs> science, uh, higher ed science and math. For example, this fun tessellation drawing that children can do connects to nature, such as this nautilus, sh this nautilus shell. And later, that idea connects to fractals, such as this Fibonacci spiral, which is in higher mathematics, which finds order in chaos. Learning to sketch 3D objects, such as this can, builds a child's spatial perception and is the stepping stone, stepping stone to calculate volume using the method of cylindrical shells in Calculus 2. This image shows the sketch on an axis as well as the calculus formula. Most universities are starting to connect STEM and arts, which is called STEAM. Elementary school should be the foundation for kids to learn arts, math, and sciences. Cutting arts will not prepare our kids for higher education. In fact, it will do the opposite. Thank you for your time. Is it Katie or Callie Simpson here? Um, our next three, um, Judy Stavile, Carrie Gale, and again, our Honorable Eduardo Montesino. Good evening. I'm Judy Stabile with Arts Now Pajaro Valley, um, Arts Now Santa Cruz County, and Create California. I'm here tonight to reconfirm our belief and commitment to all PVUSD students at all grade levels having equitable access to sequentially taught, standards based, visual and performing arts learning opportunities. We must address the issue of equity and believe that there is a way to move towards meeting the goal of equity within the current constraints without sacrificing thriving programs. We recommend the following. With Proposition 28 funding going to individual school sites, we recommend principals and district administrators work together to secure a plan to fund a visual arts teacher at every site at the elementary level. We encourage um, creative thinking about utilizing budgeted FTEs and sharing staff assignments as schools who have no visual art teachers while maintaining veteran art teachers full time at their current sites. Develop a new equitable five year community driven VAPA plan that reflects the current climate funding and circumstances and engage the community, community in a transparent process and rely on the expertise of the VAPA district staff. Rather than responding to decreasing enrollment through FTEs, we encourage the district to consider the long-term implications and provide equitable arts education to those who are attending classes right now. Our students in each and every school at every level deserve the same opportunity to excel in and through the arts. Our students, um, gosh, in addition to building creativity and imagination, the arts teach critical thinking, empathy, and resilience. Arts support learning in all other content areas and engage students and bring joy to learning. And we encourage you to allow that joy. Thank you.
Hi, Kara Gill. I'm a Mar Vista parent, and um, my older daughter actually got to take art at Mar Vista. My daughter that goes there currently has never taken art at Mar Vista, and it's incredibly sad. Um, I signed her up for an art camp this summer so she could get some extra time. Um, I was also disappointed to hear, and I actually took the job at Aptos Junior because I was told it would be job security, um, even though we were told that these elementary positions would be permanent positions due to the release time in the contract. Um, so I made that choice, and now I'm glad because I was very disappointed to hear of the decision that was being made not to rehire the empty elementary art positions and asking art teachers to be split between two campuses. Um, part, some of these art teachers are integral part of their campus. You know, they, they work in the after school program. They've made these connections with their community and to split them is unfair. It's not um, an ideal job for anyone. Um, at the time when I was hired, the community had rallied and asked for visual arts to be back to, brought back to the schools and as a parent, I feel the same way today. Um, as a teacher, I know that the arts are part of what makes certain kids want to come to school every day. So if we wanna work on attendance, art is critical. In my own experience as a student, I cannot tell you how many times I've had a teacher say, I'm not an artist or I can't draw as they begin to demo an art lesson on the board. Why are we putting one more legally required subject area on general ed teachers at these schools? Um, and from my understanding, McQuitty does not have an art teacher. So three schools this year with no art teacher, not two. Um, there has been no professional development of how to use these new national standards in their classrooms, although we're spending two days on science. Um, the arts have always been a subject that has been seen as disposable. They're now paying art teachers less in Houston because it's not seen as, of, as valuable. Um, the arts have also been a subject that has you know, been able to be disposed of, and research has shown it's integral to learning um, to develop visual literacy for young kids. The arts incorporate all subject matters to deepen and expand student learning. And the best thing is for our students to have access to visual arts, music, drama, PE, all of the things they are legally entitled, entitled to. Um, when I got my multiple subject credential, the focus was not on art, it was math, language arts, social studies, and science, so we need to make sure that we give our, our kids specialists who know how to teach art. Eduardo Montesino, you know, um, as a community, and in our community, well, we need the arts. You know, it's, if you if you saw, we were very supported as a city uh, at the Porter Building because the um, because the community uh, wants the benefit because we don't see that enough, and and uh, I encourage you to fund both of them and continue on that path because uh, as I, I remember my school um, eight years, I, I I didn't grow up here. I grew up in Santa Cruz, and I I, I went to the La Vega School, and I had. Yeah, I had an opportunity to uh, draw, and I had, a, I had an opportunity to um, play instruments. Uh, and uh, so we want to pr provide that for our community and foster that because uh, um, uh, people learn in different ways and different manners, and some people, you know, flourish with these opportunities. So, so thank you very much. Okay, and our next three speakers, uh, Susan Gralty, Christy um, Sudil, and Julie Baird. Is Susan here? Susan. No? Sorry. Oh, okay. S Christy Suchel. And then after Christy is Julie Baird. Good evening. I spoke previously on this. Um, very briefly, just going to say, I can't imagine um, an art teacher going to two locations and having to memorize that many students and supposed to have an impact. It's a little bit contradictory um, to the whole purpose of the arts, right? You're, you're making connection. Um, I'm just thinking back to my son. He's now in high school and the experiences he had. Um, he was at one of the charter schools. Lots of extra opportunities there, and yet I still put him in an after-school drumming group, um, Tycho here in Watsonville. Um, I still made sure that he had additional arts, and we would go all the way to Aptos for um, those Wednesday camps that they have, because there just wasn't as much opportunity happening in Watsonville. It's pretty sad. Um, after-school programs are great, but that's after homework, right? And so it's important that the arts are being paid attention to as a primary need. It shouldn't be a secondary goal. It should be a primary need. 
So I'm just hoping that everybody is paying attention to what's actually happening um, with the students, as everybody has mentioned um, multiple times, and it's only been brought up once tonight. The pandemic has had a huge emotional toll on these students. I'm a CASA, and every time I'm working with my kiddos and they're going through tough times, it is drawing that gets them out of their shell. That's how we make those first few connections, and that's pretty much always how it's going to be. So if we're not prioritizing this for the students on a regular basis, it's highly unlikely that there's going to be any major changes for the students at this time. I hope that there is going to be more funding, not less funding than what I just saw in this presentation. Thank you. Hi, my name is Julie Baird. Um, I don't have anything prepared, but I spoke here before advocating for the arts so at the risk of sounding repetitive. Um, I am a carpet designer. I started in the carpet industry right out of college um, because I went to school for textile design because I love my art class in high school. My art teacher just passed away this past year, but she was the one who pointed me in the direction. So I work with architects and interior designers. So there are a lot of design jobs out there and we design in the built world and I love the props earlier because I've designed a whole uh, fractile collection because the research that she's teaching these kids there are studies that show the impact of fractals on the built world and when you go into a senior living um, those bringing that nature element inside um, relaxes and has a positive impact on our society as a whole um, I'm also a parent um, my kids went through Mar Vista um, and Aptos Junior and Aptos High School. Uh, Carrie Gill was um, my daughter Quinn's teacher, and Quinn has benefited from having her as a teacher and won an award for the Mosaic Project that's going on down here in Watsonville, so that was very exciting. Um, I had the luxury of being able to supplement the arts that they lacked by going to Mar Vista, um, and I helped start an art school for children, mostly Aptos children, and then I realized that the kids in Watsonville weren't getting that same outside experience. So I, when the kids were little, I was able to work for Mariposa Art and go into the high school and be part of that program. Um, my career keeps me too busy to be doing that anymore, but um, all kids need art. Some of them need drama, some of them need music, some of them need art. They all find their safe place. I tried music, I wasn't very good at it but I did thrive in the arts and I did find my safe place that she was talking about. So they need, all kids need access to all of them. Our next three, uh, Jennifer Kahn, Lucia Herrera, and Rhea Hurt. Good evening, my name is Jennifer Kahn, and I'm a retired PVUSD kindergarten teacher. I taught for 38 years, my last 34 here, and I'm in Elementary. Studies have shown that students who study um, music have increased achievement and proficiency in math, reading, and cognitive development. Studies also show that visual arts have a positive impact on students' ability to organize their thoughts and writing and promote sophisticated reading skills. Art programs also has a po have a positive influence on student behavior and school climate. I'm advocating for the impl implementation of both visual arts and music at all elementary levels in a way that the teachers are not stretched too thin and can be, uh, provide quality lessons. I know from first-hand experience how the arts make learning more engaging and fun. I used to incorporate a lot of both visual arts and music into my curriculum. For many years, I would have up to five performances a year where parents would come into my classroom to see their children perform. They saw firsthand what we were studying and also learned techniques of how to work on academics in a fun and engaging way. These performances were great PR and helped develop a safe, trusting environment where parents felt welcome and included. We know how important the arts are and how they help to provide differentiation to all modalities of learning. They need to be implemented for all students. And I know you're working on that and I, I thank you and appreciate it. As the late great Maya Angelou said, when you know better, you do better. Well, we do know better and I hope that you do better. And welcome back, Mr. Sheckman. <laughs> thank you. Good evening, my name is Lucia Herrera. Many of you already know me. I have been attending many of the latest board meetings. In June 28, board meeting agenda was, or said, 
Each school can determine which program or programs it will offer. School administrators, in collaboration with teachers, families, students, should to, uh, together make the choice that best serves the students in their local school community. The Amesti community parents, teachers, students, and community members chose to keep the visual art program at our site. Could you please reconsider the decision and keep the program as it was for the last nine years? We can use Amesti as a pilot to see how it will turn out. I have my plans for uh, many plans for for our school, a mural next to the, our cafeteria about migration, represented with my uh, migration of the monarch butterflies. This will pair with the students creating animations about migration stories of our families. This will be very positive for our bilingual community. Please reconsider your decision. Remember, teachers, parents and community members came and speak about their choice. They want visual arts in Amesti. Do not forget that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening, board members and interim superintendent Murray Sheckman. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. My name is Ria Hurt. I'm the TOSA for Visual and Performing Arts at PVUSD, and I also teach a master's in education, graduate students at UC Santa Cruz, how to teach art in public schools. Uh, so the last time I was here, I brought up my concern that the arts plan that was in place and articulated in the LCAP was changed without community input regarding visual arts specialists at the elementary level. There are a few things I wanted to clarify. Um, one, offering 50% visual art specialists at sites by splitting is, ac is actually changing the programs. It's offering 50% less, just to clarify that. And um, there were a couple of little errors. I know it's a lot to keep track of, but this coming year, for example, McQuitty, um, Mar Vista, and Rio Del Mar will not have a visual art specialist. Um, Regardless of what proper Prop 28 may bring, our community had envisioned a plan for specialists for both visual and, and performing arts, not one or the other. Um, and just so you know that when we talk about arts literacy, visual art specialists can really tackle many of the five disciplines of, of, of art. And um, music teachers can do drama, music, dance. So if we have those two in place, we can really reach um, a lot of our requirements for ed code. Um, this pivot to general ed teachers teaching visual art isn't really done with enough foresight to for a successful implement implementation for this coming year. Um, I'm concerned about that. Um, and so I'm asking, like as I suggested in the proposal I submitted to the board, that um, we continue to rehire for those teachers who have left and really include arts experts and curriculum and the uh, art coordinator in order to make any changes to programs to make sure that we're doing it the right way. Thanks. And our last public speaker on this topic is our very own Nelly Vaquera Box. Hello, Nelly Baquera Boggs, um, president of PBFT, but also um, an educator here. And uh, I wanted to speak to this as well because, and you've heard me speak to it um, in May when this first came forward. And it, what was kind of surprising to me is that you, our trustees, were going to take this information provided from by the administrators and either approve it Unfortunately, you didn't. You pushed it forward um, to another date, and here we are. Uh, Prop 28, I just you can go to the CDE page and get the frequently asked questions. So I'll give this over to Clint since he's our CBO, and he should already like kind of be confident on, hey, 80% of that money goes to staff. Now, what you're seeing in the presentation is what our contract language is, say, is stating. And Great, we negotiate 
for um, parameters for, for our, our work, for our people, our members, so that they could have a sustainable workload. But one of the things that's happened over the many years recently is the workload of the teachers has been increased. And the proposal is to increase the workload of the art teacher. And the argument is, oh, we're following the contract. Because what that's telling the parents is that we don't want to offer your student anything more than what the PVFT contract has laid out for the teacher. Um, so release time, yes, we have that. Release time is important for our educators so that they can grade papers, so they can plan lessons, so they can communicate with their colleagues, so they can communicate with parents, so they can maybe attend an IEP meeting. Actually, that doesn't happen during their release time, so take that back, scratch that. Um, and then there uh, is the opportunity to have a teacher come in while the teacher of the classroom, the general teacher, um, is still there which has happened, that's actually how Save the Music came in. Because Save the Music doesn't bring money into this district, it brings instruments. Prop 28 is funding, is additional funding, additional. So there is Thank no you. reason that's to make some serious t cuts for this upcoming year. That's two minutes. Thank you, but status quo before you start making some serious changes, thanks. Any discussion from the board? Trustee Scott? It's my understanding that as of today, McQuitty will not have a visual art teacher as of today. Is that true? Because we've heard that at, earlier we heard, and just to clarify where we're coming from the board, the board heard about these changes from the community when our teachers were getting notices saying you're gonna be split uh, that's the first I heard about it, and there was concern. So there wasn't the process that should have taken place, in my opinion. And my understanding is we have we have an art plan from four or five years ago where we're supposed to have sequential art, and I don't see how this honors that if we're not having any visual art specialists at two elementary, three elementary schools, and by the ways we don't have any at three middle schools. So can, and the first question is, McQuitty. Next. So I believe I will have to refer to um, HR, but I believe we are in the process of hiring one. I think we have a vacancy there. Right, because well, what was the, the... It is a point five, and we're looking to hire one right now. Yeah, because we were told last time that the Minty White teacher was gonna be reduced there and split at McQuitty, and then she was told she wasn't gonna do that. So she is gonna get to stay at Minty White, where the kids there will enjoy art two times a week, but the other schools will not. So you're saying that a point five, the plan is to hire just a point five from McQuitty as of now. So our hope is to hire that position. In the meantime, we are making sure that we are holding to not moving a teacher when we do not have that space, when we don't have, when we don't need to, right? So we wanna keep them providing that release time and that instruction there and in a hope to be able to fill that position over at McQuitty. Thank you, another question I had is with regards to um, the, the, inconsist the chart didn't show it, but it's important that one of the community members said, some schools we've had art two times a week last year and Soldo and Amesti had the K through three kids were getting art twice a week. Some schools were getting one time a week. And so what we've heard is that the, pa the previous administration said, let's not rehire VAPA teachers who are leaving. Like, so we had one at Ann Soldo, we had one at Landmark, and we're gonna split instead. I don't recall our board approving that decision. Can you speak to that? So I'll talk to that. It's not about how many times a student see it a week, it's the number of minutes. So if a student sees an art teacher two times a week, it could be for each time it's 50 minutes while when it, you only have art one time a week, it could be 400 minutes. So it's dependent on how the schedule is built for each individual school. That's dependent on how many teachers they have, how many students they have. So each um, release schedule or each schedule looks different dependent on the school. So it, we'd have to look at the actual minutes that the students received art. Um, that's the first one. The, um, 
with the second one, what we're looking at, as you know, um, part of that decision that was coming by is we are in declining enrollment. And as we decline in students, we, are, we do have um, a need for less teachers. It's not just art teachers, it's not just science teachers, it's not just PE teachers, but it's teachers as a whole. And so part of that decision that came down is because we do have to hire or have less teachers in our teaching staff because we are on declining enrollment. Um, when you have less students, you have less staff. Though I note that varies school to school. Some schools are having greater rates than others in different parts of the district and something our board should grapple with. I don't think we've we made that decision formally yet. Um, I mean, I think, and what I want to say is that this was, you know, Prop 28 is great, but that's not what this is about. This is really about programmatic funding, uh, the, our program, our arts program, our music program, our science program at our elementary schools mm -hmm. across the board. It was never about one or two schools. And so I'm glad, I want to thankful to my board colleagues that we've continued this discussion. And so then I understand the need for, the preference for consistency across elementary schools. Some elementary schools have sixth grade, some do not. So there's, there's always tweaks and some have other characteristics that make them unique. But I think it would, would be great to offer, it would be excellent for PVUSD to offer art, music, and science at least two times a week. And that's not what this, this plan is saying, well, let's take art down across the board one time a week. And that doesn't seem fair or visionary. Uh, and it doesn't seem consistent to me with our, our previous art plan, where it talks about, and we also want to note, we do not offer art to any of our fourth and fifth graders. And so I think we can make some improvements. I, it's a good idea to come up with a long-term plan. Certainly, I think that's a great idea, and this time to include our VAPA staff, our, our VAPA coordinator and our VAPA staff and our teachers. I think that's a great Science. idea. But um, I think we can make some improvements this year, because um, there's still some time and what I'd love to see is some collaboration. We have an excellent new superintendent. We have our arts staff eager to collaborate to try to make some improvements before the year starts. I think there's time. I think we can do it. Um, so that's, um, I would love to see a little more work done on this uh, to be brought to our next meeting. So that's, um, which I know that's later on the agenda. We may, we're gonna figure out what to do about August 9th, but I would love to see an improved plan on how we can ensure art is at all the schools and that we're not punishing, reducing the schools that were really heading in the right direction and Soldo and Amesti. So I think we can do a little more work here. Within that work, I'd also like to see like what you were saying. It's not just about the visual arts, it's also about the music, it's also about the science. So it's the programming for all students because the, yeah. the other disciplines are just as important. I, and so that's something that we have to include. 100%. So when we, when we go to meet, it does need to include um, educators from the, all disciplines. Well, I'm 100% with you on that. That's a fair point, absolutely. Anyone else? Trustee Flores? Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, I think it would be nice to see a little more clarity instead of just like X's, maybe adding to that minutes that they're actually being taught because it does differ amongst the, the campuses. Um, I am in full support of forming a committee to come up with a you know five-year plan just like we had for Save the Music. I think we definitely need to have something in place. I think this committee needs to have stakeholders like what we've seen here today. I think it's amazing that we have these community members willing to be here <laughs> meeting after meeting after meeting to really stand their ground and say, you know, we are not going to let this go. So I think it needs to include a lot of them. And our, our, we've had several students here. I love seeing our youngsters here, you know, fighting for what they want to see in their day. And so I, we can't just ignore it. And I do think it needs to be a little more thought out. And um, so yes, I'm in support of, again, the, you had three criteria, three items there. Um, definitely in support of that last one for sure right now you know we need to start that I just wanted to because I remember there were um, some questions about like the can we, Clint maybe this is a question for you but can you reiterate what was the issue with the prop 28 funding 
Sure. So Prop 28 funding, like a lot of funding we see, Title I, um, additional restrictive funding, has a supplant versus supplement clause. So we can't necessarily take a teacher and say, we're going to pay for this out of Prop 28 so you no longer lose a teacher, because the state could look at that as supplanting what we're doing. Um, with that in reducing, there is the possibility of a site having a council meeting and adding back in reduced FTE because that wouldn't be considered supplanting because to Lisa's point, we're declining in enrollment. So we do need to make reductions consistent with what the needs are to be able to stay fiscally solvent as well as provide not just what's in the contract, but actually ensure that teachers are working the seven hours that we're providing them because we do get into STIRS implications if they have extra time and they're not doing what's in their actual job description. We do run into problems with STIRS. So, with Prop 28, our biggest concern was there's really two things. One is it is truly a site decision. So if the site should meet, um, you heard them speak about Amesti has spoken. Amesti really needs to meet as a group and show. What an auditor will look at is did you actually meet and discuss what plan you want to do? That plan also has to show that that art teacher is providing services to students for the time we're paying. So we can't add time if we're going to say, we're adding an additional four hours to this individual, but they're only teaching for two. Unless they're, we can show that what the other parts they're doing are directly impacting students, so if their prep time, which is in their contract, is being used, totally fine, but we do have to follow a lot of regulations, especially with restricted money. Um, as Nelly mentioned, yes, 80% has to be used on staffing. Um, no site actually gets enough money in the elementary level to fund a full staff member, unfortunately. CDE, if you read that FAQ, which, yes, Nelly, I have read it multiple times, um, one of the FAQs actually asked, what do we do, can we share among sites? Is that something we're able to do where two, two sites share one teacher with Prop 28 funds, and Prop 28 says, CDE says, absolutely, because that's their intent. I was talking to SoCal, um, their CBO, they're getting like $11,000 for one site. Can't do much with $11,000 when 80% has to go to staffing. For us, we're jet, we're, Thankfully, we get a little bit more where, you know, some of our elementaries are at 70, 80,000. It's still, unfortunately, not enough for a full teacher, but it is enough to share with another site. So even with Prop 28, some of the intent is you're going to share, or potentially, if a teacher right now is sharing two sites, you could pay for their other 50%. So they don't share a site, and they're only at your site. But again, that would be... Um, looking at what we've done in terms of reductions and then being able to prove to the auditors in the CDE, we're not supplanting, we're actually providing above and beyond what we need to provide by not just contract, but by staffing ratios. And I know at the last meeting we were waiting for some clarity mm -hmm. on that. Do we have that clarity now? Yes, yeah, so we talked to our auditors because one of our biggest concerns was if we were to say reinstate somebody who was a half time and said we're gonna now make them a full time at this site, um, would we be able to do that or would they consider, because what typically auditors do is they'll look at 22, 23, which we just ended that year and say, what did you spend and now what are you spending this year? If you're not spending more, then you're not spending Prop 28 on additional staff. You're actually supplanting and you can't do that. <coughs> However, the argument we made with the auditors is when you're in declining enrollment, you're going to reduce staff. It's going to happen. So how can you give us additional funding and say, it's going to be supplanting when we're actually reducing. So does that mean that we couldn't actually use the Prop 28 to supplement, to, that if we didn't reduce in this way to start with, that we couldn't then use, like if, if we do it this way and approve a plan that temporarily reduces, then we can use Prop 28 because we've reduced and then we can build it back up? But if we don't do it that way, then that's considered supplanting, and then rather than sup, uh, sorry, is it supplementing? Is that yeah. what I'm understanding? Correct. So effectively, what we're doing is we're showing we're making a needed reduction based on what's required in our contract and our staffing ratios. That's a necessary reduction due to declining enrollment. Prop 28 now can come and say, I want to reinstate those because you have additional funding for the arts. Again, that is a decision, as Lisa noted based on the site, they could ask for dance, they could ask for music, they could ask for coding. There's a lot of different options in Prop 28. Um, but, I, but yes, when we talk to our auditors, we kind of let them know, if we show that we've reduced, because we need to through declining enrollment, 
would pro would you find this to be supplanting? Again, our auditors, one person, um, but what they say is what we're most likely going to look at is that you have added with Prop 28. And they said, based on the explanation you've given us, we feel that would be sufficient to show you're using the money in good faith. So this is a way to actually to grow it, although it is a temporary. Unfortunately, yes. To be able to utilize Prop 28, we do need to show that the district did have the intent to reduce based on effectively what we call creating our base. What is the base level of need? Um, Prop 28 would be everything above that base level of need. So to the point that came up of art in a classroom for one, for one day versus two days. If we say our base is one day, that's what we, we are going to provide district-wide is one day of art, then we absolutely could say, but this site wants to provide a second day with their Prop 28 funds, absolutely allowable. A couple points. So we know we heard in our budget workshop declining enrollment is a problem, faces our district, it's a statewide problem, and we're gonna have to figure out how to cope and deal with it. And I respect, I understand that, I'm not disputing that. This uh, notion that we should therefore reduce art and music to only one, and I don't agree with music, one, music is one time a week, but I, music 45 minutes a week, one teacher, it, that's not a visionary, that's not where we need to be. And I know, understand we have this agreement with Save the Music and it is where it is for next year. But that's, we can, I think we can do a little better than that, um, respective of, of the challenges Clint is, is describing. And so the notion that we're gonna reduce everything to one time a week uh, with art and music, I don't, that I think we can try a little harder. That's the spirit of what I'm trying to get at here. And we can be creative. I'm not against splitting 100% of the time. I, I do think it's unfair when you have programs, successful programs to, at Ann Soldo and Amesti and Minty. I do think that's, a, but there are, I know Bradley and Starlight has a split that's been somewhat uh, manageable. So I'm not against that. But I think we can do better. Three elementary schools, or two, the two elementary schools, the two Aptos schools, having no visual arts specialist, McQuitty, maybe if they can, I think we can do a little better. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to make a motion that uh, our staff work with our music, arts, science, our VAPA, and our necessary stakeholders, Nellie, the teachers, anybody else, certainly a new superintendent, to figure out how can we do a little bit better this year um, and, and to bring back an a updated proposal at our next board meeting, which will hopefully, I think, be August 9th. I know that's later on the agenda, so, but I'll say, just say the next board meeting. And I would also include the committee idea to figure out a long-term plan as well. I think that's also a good idea. That, that would be the motion I'd like to make. I just want to, to clarify, are you expecting them to meet with stakeholders between now and the next board meeting? Yes. Can I ask a clarifying question with that? In the pl proposed plan, do you, um, is it also a board's expectation that we make it so that we can supplement and not supplant? Well, I think that's worthy of the discussion, but if this is not just a Prop 28 discussion. Like, that doesn't. It would put restrictions on Prop 28 on the school sites. So I'm just curious as to board direction on the proposal if there are restrictions because that would put limitations on school sites. So we need, just need to know the no, direction that I, you would like us to go. I, so, no, I, I don't want Prop 20 to limit our thinking if that's what you're trying to. What? It would, no, so depending on if we come back with a plan that is where we, then when sites get their Prop 28 funds yeah. and looking at whether it's supplanting or, or supplementing mm -hmm. based on what we bring, right? It would limit their use of the Prop 28 funds based on what we do and we bring forward. Or, so I wanna see if there, if there are, is a board direction on making sure when it comes back. But can't, then they, when, do, can't they do more? Like when the Prop 20, when we get a sense, because I know Clint said he's gonna put that in the budget later when it comes. Can't they, I mean, it's not gonna be a sin if they even do a little more, if they have some drama, theater, I mean, why, why do we need to conflate that right now? All right, let me say a few things. Um, if you give, if your decision is to allow a committee to move forward, the committee will take into account what Clint talked about with Prop 28. Yeah. And Lisa's guarding the fort, you know, so 
let's say there's a school out there like a Mesty that has a vibrant school site council with parents involved, and, you know, maybe not kids, like at a high school, but it represents the community of Amesti, teachers, principal, classified, and parents. They, after a committee makes some recommendation and you know, dives in, can come back and say, we'd like to keep the teacher half time and we'll pay for the other half, leading to a full time. That could be done. We've got to you know, make sure we dot the I's and cross yeah. the T's. But I also want to add, ladies and gentlemen, two things. One, I was using a youthful vernacular. I told myself I'm not supposed to be too bad. I was blown away at how this di district has grown with art. I left eight years ago. Good job. You, 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 know, you coalesced funding in a way. You got grants out there. And you really increased it. So we're kind of in a difficult point now. Um, Clint is very right about enrollment. But the bigger issue for me was seeing the inconsistency across the board, not just art, science, music. Now, some of the schools and some parents will say, no, music's not important. I don't know. But science? A third grader in XYZ school isn't exposed to science at all? That's not right. And if I can influence the board in this community in any way, uh, I, I made up a word a, a long time ago, and it's called consistify. Bad English, sorry, but you all get it. My children went through this district and had a good, a, um, a good education. But it seemed like what they, and a couple of them changed schools, it seemed like they had the same opportunities at different schools. That's a goal of mine. That's a bigger picture. But the focus is art. I think that my colleagues here have given us an opportunity to explore. If you, you know, if you want us back on August 9th, fine. If that works for the, the, those agenda items, I don't think we'll have the thorough discussion that we can have over two weeks. But Zoom makes things a lot more accommodating. And I would welcome it. Um, Thank you. I just want to reiterate, my understanding is that Rio Del Mar, which is one of the schools that didn't have, they have a parent alliance funded art teacher through the, the Santa Cruz Arts Council. Is that correct? From my understanding, that is correct. Okay, so they do have art, it's just not district funded. Correct. Uh, Trustee Acosta? Um, uh, thank you, President Holm. Um, I'm not sure what I'm looking for. I think I'm, I'm fine with moving forward with um, seconding uh, Trustee Milano Scow's motion. Um, with that, I do have a couple added comments um and and in things that i'd like to see i fully agree I'd, about the um committees right i think that was the third bullet point there mm -hmm. um and i think looking at it sort of like how um i think it was referenced like to the bond committees right i think so there's a bigger bond committee and then there's the site committees that decide for the sites right um i think to look at it at that level and so there should be like a greater committee but then the site level and site feeding into that and then that greater committee also feeding into this board because the board gets the final say of that direction right so that's kind of the vision that I'd like to see with that um, um, and hopefully we could see that and and I also have to agree with um, I think that the rollout timing of this about how we as board members heard of it um, at least seemingly maybe the majority of the board members heard about this and having to hear about it from the public versus the administration is totally unacceptable and I think that's what a lot of the discourse that has brought us to this point that we've been having this conversation since May you know that's totally unacceptable I mean it is the seven members the seven elected members of the board that makes the decisions for the direction of the district right that directs one person in the district so um, hopefully we just don't ever see that again. I think that's been a huge part of what has brought this problem to where we're at today. Three months, I'm counting, May, June, July. We're having this conversation. We're looking at going into August. So Trustee um, Bolano Scow, I full heartedly second your motion. And we'll see if we have the August 9th meeting. I do agree. That's a further agenda item with other topics. But I support that and support these 
additional committees, a greater committee for the district and then the site committees for each school site. To, to clarify, at what point would, like if, if we have further discussion, at what point would that limit, like is, is there a time frame by which our options for Prop 28 funding would be limited? So really what it's going to do is it's going to prevent the time in which we can spend Prop 28. So we have Prop 28 for the 23-24 school year. So the longer you wait, the longer you're unspending dollars. Um, we don't have any information yet on Prop 28. Will it end up in fund balance? Will, it, will we be able to roll it over to the next year and use it on something else? They haven't clarified. So I don't know if it's a use it or lose it type of funding or if it'll end up rolling over to the next year. They That is one piece they haven't really discussed in their FAQs. Um, so that's the biggest limitation. I think to your point that you were trying to address earlier, if we don't say that the district is reducing based on declining enrollment, so this is not a need about, it's not about reducing art, it's not about reducing VAPA, we could reduce science, we could reduce PE, but overall we need to reduce um, release due to declining enrollment. If we don't do that and the board says, no, we actually want to continue art the way it was funded last year. We will absolutely not be able to use Prop 28 to fund those positions, which means we'll be adding about roughly probably $500 to a million dollars to a budget where we're getting deficit spending $9 million in our third year out versus use, utilizing brand new funding to be able to provide above and beyond the necessities to run the district. So again, it's, it's strategically using Prop 28 to provide additional above and beyond what we've been doing. I think I, I've mentioned this before in my presentations. Um, Prop 28 really was designed for districts not really like ours. We, we've done an amazing job of providing art and music to our schools. Um, there are schools, I know CBOs in Santa Cruz County where they don't have art in some of their schools because funding didn't allow it. We get a lot more funding from concentration than they do. We were able to allow it. So Prop 28 was really trying to influx art into schools, we ended up getting the benefit of we already had it. So I just want to be like if if we wait if the, as a board, if we decide to wait two more weeks, is that going to jeopardize that option? So really again what it'll do is it'll just mean that the Prop 28, so sites technically wouldn't be able to build their Prop 28 plan mm -hmm. because if we say we're going to fund an extra, for example, we use MSD, we're going to fund the additional 0.5 at MSD out of general fund, so unrestricted dollars, mm -hmm. then they wouldn't be able to say we're using our Prop 28 to fund an additional 0.5 because we would have already funded it. Now, they could do an another 0.5 on top of that, but we run in really, which has been brought up before, is we run into a problem of minutes. There's just not enough minutes in the day. There's just not to provide math, science, ELA, I mean, all of the things we need to provide. So uh, technically we have already reduced, correct? Technically the board did approve the, redu the reduction. Right. Yes, so that approved. if we continue the conversation, then we, we're already recovered. As long as we, it's, if we're, we're, it's, we're not, we, we don't, sorry, I'm trying to, the, the words just kind of all got in a jumble in my head, pardon me. We don't jeopardize that until there's a point at which, if we decided to reverse it. Correct. So if, okay. if you were to say now we actually want to fund those mm -hmm. and we want to add it, the additional through general fund unrestricted, okay. we would jeopardize the ability to use Prop 28 on those positions. All right. So that's something to be mindful of, but like deciding to continue the discussion now is not jeopardizing it. Correct. Okay. Jen, I have some comments. Yeah, go ahead. If, if that's okay. Thanks. Thanks. Um, can we go, can we put your presentation up again? I'd like to see the slide um, that showed, I think, the current year plan. The second and third slide. Yeah. So since I've been here, while you guys are putting that up, since I've been here a long time, I do remember um, when we had no art, no music, and so I feel really proud of the of what we've built here in this district and what we've been able to afford by scrimping in other areas to allow for arts education. So 
I think, and you guys can correct me, that the original plan and how we were able to put the art teachers into the elementary schools was because the first through third graders bargained for and were, and we negotiated release time for them, and the release time teacher was an art teacher, correct? That is correct. Okay, and that was a point five position, if I remember correctly. Depends on the number of People students serving their at the school. No. So it all depends on the number of students that are at the school. So on average, um, it it depends on the number of classes. I should say, not the number of students, but the number of teachers that they are releasing. So it all depends on the size of the school, of how much that they receive. But all students would get 120 minutes approximately a week. That was the original yes. Yes. plan. So many schools only had a .5 art teacher at that time. People Possibly. are still shaking their heads no. Because I don't remember there ever being a full-time art teacher at many of these schools. Even like Valencia, which is my home school, we had you know, almost 500 or 550 children there. And I don't remember having a full-time art teacher there. So Freedom's one of our larger schools that had a full-time mm -hmm. teacher, so it all is dependent on the number of teachers that are being served. Mm -hmm. If it is a smaller school, say like Mar Vista, it was probably a .5. Um, teacher I know those early years were very difficult because um, those teachers were given an art cart and they essentially mm -hmm. went from classroom to classroom and we got a lot of complaints about that but we didn't have the extra classrooms on campus at that time to that um, accommodate but I felt really happy that kids were getting access to art during those times that is correct so what is the plan for Mar Vista and Rio since that happens to be in my area because we can't leave them at, without an art teacher. So hopefully we are actively looking for an art teacher or what, what is happening there? So currently I believe for Rio, for example, they have PE and music and that's the number of release minutes they get. They had more than enough, they had too much. You know how we're trying to consider, they had too, too much release. release teachers. Are the visual arts teacher actually um, I believe they retired um, this last year, so it helped us with that attrition piece as we moved to the Save the Music, the music, and, the, and we continued with the PE that was there. So how are some of the other schools getting art, music, and science, if, like at Landmark, for example? So they would not be full FTE, so sometimes you have they're divided, let's say, a, um, a primary grade, like a first grade teacher might be getting some music and some art based on, um, the again, the number of teachers at the site. Okay, well, I'm just gonna say on behalf of Aptos, Mar Vista and Rio Del Mar need an art teacher. So I don't know how we're gonna make that happen, but they have to have it. So that goes back to looking at our, our five-year committee plan and yeah. consistify. Uh, it, across the district, um, consistification. Cons cons consistification across the district, our science, physical education, if the, and also um, the visual arts and the music. So, so there needs to be consistification. Yeah, so let's just talk for a minute just about the PE and the science areas. Because I have asked this for the 13 years that I've been sitting here is why why doesn't Rio Del Mar have science? Like that seems very important. And yet, I know the answer to this because I've asked it enough times, so I'm just gonna say it and you can tell me if it's right, that the school community prefers PE, like the school chose, the, ch the school has been offered multiple times whether they want a science release teacher and they chose to continue their PE program instead for the release of the fourth through sixth graders. Yes, when release first came out, that was the initial choice, yes. And now? Um, I don't know same? when the last Are they time we still we've making that like the site council still making that decision along with the. Staff? I don't think it's the same physical education teacher that has been there, and so that same physical education is there. If um, they chose to leave, then that teacher would be uh, displaced, and so because it's the same teacher, that teacher is there and consistent. Yeah. And is that the same like for Bradley and Calabasas and McQuitty? Like they're choosing PE. That is correct. Yeah. And PE is important, like we all can agree that all of these things are very, very important. However, I, I do think science <laughs> needs to be in all the elementary schools. So that's my preference. Um,
Is there a way, and this is a nutty question, I know, so I'm sorry, Nelly, in advance. Is there a way to negotiate more minutes in the day so that some of these things that we want? <laughs> She's saying no. <laughs> well, because I'll just, I'll, yeah. Yeah. It is state requirements for. It is, mm -hmm. okay. I'll just say, you know, being a parent in the early years in my kids' school, it, it, the curriculum, the, the things that, teachers need to teach it goes by very very fast and I feel like the kids are really rushed so and the res recesses have been squeezed down to not very many minutes anymore and I just feel like um, anyway but I understand okay so there's a lot of questions a lot of things that we can think about with the committee and we have just a reminder we have an excellent opportunity with our expanded learning opportunity program that is extremely the after robust. school program yeah that well no it's before and after school, it's a, yeah. it's a full day. That's part of the school day, as a continuation of the day. So in the old days when there was zero art, zero music in the schools, I was the arts coordinator and I wrote a lot of grants in those days, but in particular to the Spectra Arts Program, which is through the Santa Cruz Arts Council. And um, I still think that $2,000 every semester is up for grabs for every school and, and we are completely eligible across our district. And many years when I was coordinating the arts programs, grants would go and they, they had money left over. They had, nobody was applying and that meant all of the Pajaro schools. And, like there was only a few people, a few schools applying. So I would like to see us apply for that money if possible. It's not a lot of money I know, but I think it would help. Noted. Thank you. Trustee Dodge Jr. I'd like to support trustees Scal's idea of having establishing committees as this chart clearly shows Mini White is ranking towards the bottom and you know with, with no science or music you know I, I attended those schools you know Mr. Sheckman understands that e, uh, Mini White is a feeder school into E A Hall and Watsonville High and without science or music that affects our children and so I would like to, you know, to have that committee established and hopefully um, the parents, I know the parents at Miniway have a very good school site council. I know the principal at Miniway is a visionary and I hope they could see the importance and see what we're missing. And we're missing music and science at our schools and so hopefully they get involved and be active. So I stand behind your, the first and the second to continue this conversation. Thank you. Vice President Acosta, do you have further comments? Yeah, I just have one additional that um, was coming to my mind when I was listening to Trustee Dodge Jr. speak. Um, in, in December, at our organizational meeting, right, we have the committees that board members select to be on. And I think that it m might be part of the direction of this when we're talking about having a larger committee and then the subcommittees at the site levels that um, maybe we consider board placement, which could be up to three members, that there's be for that and so just for us as agenda setting committee when we're looking forward to going into December to make that meeting that we consider adding that as potentially a committee um, with an openings for up to three board members to be sitting on to be also reporting back I think that will be very helpful we and already have an arts committee well right but I'm we're speaking about w whether it's an expansion of that you know that this is encompassed because I think what I th what I was feeding off of what Trustee Flores said and what Trustee Scow was supporting, she said, was we know also from what Clint has said, I believe there has to be the site committee levels, but there should be a greater committee, right? The sites are sort of reporting and feeding into and then that committee feeding into this board. So that greater committee, I think, needs to have, you know, seats for, we need to consider having that a subcommittee for this board. Whether it's one and the same, an extension of it or something completely separate. I just think that's for a um, topic for us to consider going into December. Great. So can you reiterate your motion again, please? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm not sure Thank what you. the motion is. So um, I want uh, my motion would be to uh, that we have a long term committee looking at how we can have art, music, P and science at all of our elementary schools in a in a building way not a declining way and, and 
and that's going to take some time. And that in the short term, um, that staff work with uh, the relevant stakeholders, including our, our, our VAPA team and our teachers, on how we can improve this to offer, to close these gaps this year. And considering Prop 28 and, and other things in our budget, I think we are poised to have 50 or $60 million in reserve. So maybe there's something we can dig. I mean, maybe we can afford to hire a few more teachers. I mean, we're a school district. We're supposed to hire teachers. I and mean, I realize we're in declining enrollment. But I want to see us build all the great work. And I acknowledge that we've been building on art and music. So let's not reduce it. Let's, let's keep it up. So that, that's, sorry for the rhetoric. Okay, motion so, clear? so the, yeah, no. so what's so the, the motion? motion is to have a to the long term um, committee for the, looking at solutions for filling the gaps, and then just to continue the conversation with uh, you know VAP with VAPA leaders and short term solutions short -term as well solutions. as well filling the gaps, and then to come back to the board with you know potential solutions and the next board meeting at the next board meeting whenever board that meeting. is. And I seconded that motion. Yes. I, I, yes. And can I ask just one elaborating question? I know we don't have um, our assistant super of HR here, but Clint, maybe you can answer it. If not, Mr. Saxon might be able to answer this. Because we keep hearing over and over, and we all know it. I mean, you've got a few of us up here who work in higher ed. We're dealing with declining enrollment at that level, too, right? It is inevitable. Um, we keep talking about this declining enrollment issue. We just heard earlier our teacher vacancy is at what? Our regular teachers, not? So our 20 for, that was for our special ed and regular teachers. Too. Okay. So we're talking about declining enrollment, but we also haven't reduced the number of teachers we have in the district at this point. Correct. So what we did, if you don't mind. Just for clarification. Minute, yeah. Um, so what we've done over the past three years, actually, when I first started at CBO, Allison and I got together and said we really need to look at staffing because we didn't feel it was being adequately looked at each year. So what we did is we created a formula to identify how much staffing each site needs based on the number of students for that year. We never looked at release because it was such a complicated system of trying to determine minutes and how many sites are offering different minutes to Lisa's point. So release was actually not reduced in the past three years in a way of consistently across the board. So what we ended up with is some sites that needed, say, 1.5 FTE, so full-time equivalent, so one and a half teachers, to provide the necessary release had three teachers of release. And other sites that needed 1.5 had 1.5. And we said, so you have some sites that have their release, some sites that are double the release they need. And really, when we're declining enrollment, we need to look at reducing across the board, not just in classroom positions, but also release, because as you have less teachers at a site, you need less time to release those teachers. If teachers need 120 minutes, and then I think it's also 150 minutes, Nelly, both of those. So if I'll just use the 150, if you have 10 teachers, you need 1,500 minutes of release. If you drop down to five teachers at a site, you need 750. So if you have 1,500 minutes of release, is that teacher providing 1,500 minutes, or are they not providing their full time as released. So that's where it gets tricky if we do need to start looking at how we reduce that. So sorry for the long winded answer to your question. Um, we just didn't look at it in the past few years because it's a complicated system to review. We did start looking at this year to, to really right size and show that we're not gonna be burning FTE of giving a site double what they need. What we tried to do, and again, we did it only through attrition, we didn't lay anyone off, is if you have 1.5 and you have three, how about you now instead, you have two and you have 2.5. We'll make but it a little bit more easy. For general ed, we have re reduced We have year. for general yes. ed, yes. Okay. Just I, not for release. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. And I believe Trustee Flores had a question. I, I had asked for this last slide to be put back up because, yeah, this is what you're re requesting for the mm -hmm. next steps to be for us to potentially vote on tonight. Um, I hear what uh, Trustee Bonana Scala is saying. He... Um, the, I think it's the first bullet that w is, you know, I think ha we're having trouble with. You've mentioned before, and uh, Trustee Homie, you've also mentioned that we already voted to approve it. I don't remember it being a vote. I remember it being told to us. Um, did we vote on that? I actually watched you on television. You did vote. You did. We did. What was brought to you from two boards? We approved. I'm sorry, to clarify that, I think 
we approved just to bring it forward for further discussion. I don't think it was approved per se. I'm, I'm, I'm trying. There have been so many meetings in the past few months. Yeah. I'm so sorry. It's all mushing together, one big pile. Because I was, I was in the same boat. Yeah. Assistant superintendent. It, from, from my recollection, we'd have to go back. It was approved the, um, as it is shown on the 23-24 plan. What meeting? I believe it was two, yeah. So not July Dr. Rodriguez 12th. presented the item. At the end of June. The last meeting of June would be two regular board meetings ago. Okay. And June we, 17th. And we continued it. We, we can, you asked that it be brought back. We did, yeah. did have a vote. There was a fair amount of angst um, both out there. And Your here. Oh, thank you. you. My recollection is you had a vote. It was two board meetings ago. I watched on TV. I wanted to see what I was possibly getting into. Um, but my recollection says you did vote, and it should show in our minutes. You did ask that it be brought back. So you, you can choose to rewind the clock and have a new action. That's up to you. So did you, what, you had put your mic on earlier. Did you, have, did you have something else you wanted to add? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to make sure, whatever you approve, that you see the word long-term vision. Yes, the community, folks here and folks who are not here must be involved. There have been plans for VAPA. There have been plans that have been put in place. Your LCAP was well done last year. Um, but I just want to make sure we're not going to, we'll have a committee and it'll come back with a report. It won't have all the solutions. I think the, the way I hope we can look at this is that this group will work for, f well, not four or five years, but to have a vision to put X's on all of those spots. And I, I have to say, and I, I, this may not go over well, uh, the community may say no to science. We want PE. I, I have an issue there, folks. Sorry. We have a curriculum that the state has adopted. I love, uh, you know, I, as a principal, my community was as important as anybody. Um, but and students are tested by the state of California on science. Thank you. Sorry, I was fumbling. And I support the spirit of that, and I'm not going to put you. a timeline on that long term. I mean, it's going to take time, and obviously, I'd like to have input on that too. And I think my motion's clear. Is that in the second? Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. So I just want to say. I clearly seconded. Yes. Yeah. We have a first and a second. And I just want to thank everyone for your patience and for your willingness to engage in dialogue and discussion about this. I think this is a really important issue. And I just appreciate. You know, the standing up here for, what, 40 minutes or so? Uh, you know, and just, yeah. But um, I just want to acknowledge the work that this takes and the, thank you. So we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Mary, you gotta do the five on that. <laughs> All right, so moving on to 9.2. Memorandum of Understanding with Monterey County Soccer Club. The report will be presented by Clint Rucker. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Sheckman. Um, yeah, I'm here, as you may remember, a few meetings back, we had um, Jorge f come by, who is part of Monterey County Soccer Club, and offered that he wanted to come into a memorandum of understanding with our district to be able to utilize EA Hall Field to use for, so for the Monterey County Soccer Club, providing youth activities for students and for community of both Salinas and Watsonville. Um, I worked with him, he's been great to work with, and we did develop a MOU. It's very similar to the one that we have with Athletics for All, which is another nonprofit that we work with. Um, Monterey County Soccer Club is a 5013C nonprofit, and they provide, again, youth sports for students. What we're looking at is providing them with the Sundays that currently Athletics for All does not use. They'll have the opposite Sundays to be able to use the EA Hall field and the synthetic turf field free of charge, but they will provide free registration to all Pajaro Valley students, which um, Jorge informed me they actually already do. They already want to provide free access to our students. So actually our facility use agreement does say for any nonprofit that provides direct services to our students that we already don't charge a fee. 
So we're not really doing anything abnormal in terms of the cost. It's this memorandum, memorandum of understanding is really to show that every other Sunday we're just basically pre-booking those for Monterey County Soccer Club. The MOU is for one year. We typically do this with brand new MOUs as it gives the board time to hear community feedback, hear if there's any problems that we're having, and that way we're not committed to a long-term agreement. Um, we do have a termination clause if anything were to go wrong. Again, the man has been wonderful. I think it's a wonderful organization, and I would recommend the board approve this MOU so that we can support our students with athletics. Great, thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. I, I'm so, I super excited to see this come forward. You know, I've heard from the community, I've heard from you know Jorge himself, and it's I, I'm so thank you for for getting this worked out. Do we have any other board comments? Uh, Trustee Dodd Jr. Yep. Thank you, President Hall. Thank you for this. Um, I, yeah, this is a great idea, but I also heard from people who had some questions and concerns. Um, you know, I got some phone calls. Uh, I talked to some people um, from other soccer clubs because soccer space, park space in general in the city of Watsonville is really limited. And some other soccer clubs were concerned that why weren't Watsonville clubs allowed to use the field? So a couple questions that I, I received was, you know, how and when was this club chosen? How long had these talks? been in with the Salinas Soccer Club. Um, another question was, how many people are we expecting during these practices and these games? How many PVUSD students do we expect to actually join this league? Um, I also understand during the MOU it said that we're waiving fees. What does that exactly mean? Uh, what is going to be the status with the restroom facilities? Are they going to be using our facilities? Are they going to bring in facilities, restroom facilities? Uh, and just those are just some of the questions that I, I heard. And so I just wanted to see if you can answer those questions. Yeah, let me try to remember them all. Um, so the, for the first question uh, regarding when did these talks uh, happen, I believe Jorge came to a board meeting back in May, I believe it was. Is he here still? May. Um, spoke to the board. Um, uh, Dr. Rodriguez reached out to me, asked if I could reach out to Jorge and meet with him and talk about their program. Um, so that's when it started. We, it has not been long talks. We've been briefly, again, about a month or two, but trying to get an MOU together to, again, support our students. In terms of some of the other questions, I'll ask if Jorge can come up and answer some of those himself, because he'll know kind of yeah. the number of students, how many would be utilizing it, um, those types of questions. So I'm happy to have him come up and speak. Uh, sure, just to give a little bit brief background about ourselves, uh, we're the largest uh, uh, soccer organization in Northern California. Here in Watsonville itself, we have 600 kids that attend the school district. That's the largest population around here. And we do not charge anything. Just this past weekend, we had ODPs, that's Olympic Development Program for the kids. We took five kids from here, five kids from Salinas, and they went to um, Ribbon, California for trying out for Olympic team. So that's a, a cost that we paid for the families. We transported them. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to do a, a joint effort between Salinas and Watsonville because the last time you remember, there were kids here with parents and coaches saying that they go to travel to L.A., but they have no place to practice. And the fields are just sitting around, not being used. And so that's what we want to give the kids here, a choice to be able to practice and play here at home. You know, like I said, I, I support this, you know, but just for some reason, you know, these different soccer clubs were like, well, why are we giving priority to Salinas Club when we already have clubs here? And so I, I just wanted to let those people know that I'm listening and, you know, thank you for explaining. So. Yeah, and, and absolutely, and as I noted, this is why we do it typically a one-year MOU. We can see how it goes, see if it benefits our community, if our students are benefiting from this uh, MOU with Monterey County Soccer Club and then I would just highly recommend if you have questions please let me know and I'm happy to work with Jorge as well as answer any questions in that as we kind of go through the process throughout the year and see how this works out. Um, I will let you know. So with that That's being great. said, <laughs> uh, I would like to make a motion that we support this agenda this evening. I'll second. Great. Do we have any further discussion? We have a first and a second. All those in favor? 
Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you all zero. so much. All right, so going on to 9.7, or 9.7, whoops, nope, I got my, I know, I was like, wait a second, sorry, it's like, I, when I printed this out today, everything, like, got jumbled off in my printer, Do -do -do. I know, 9.3, tell me what 9.3 is, <laughs> thank you. Good evening, Board President, Dr. Holm, trustees, Superintendent Checkman, and PVOSD community. My name is Julie Edwards. I'm the coordinator of career technical education for PVOSD. And tonight, I bring you three CTE pathways to share, extending PVUSD's hands-on technical and academic learning opportunities for our students. This growth work is funded through multiple grant awards and the PVUSD LCAP Goal 2. Um, okay. okay, super excited to tell you about a brand new pathway at New School, Professional Music. It is in the arts, media, and entertainment um, industry, um, which is one of the 15 industry sectors in California. It is an entrepreneurship, music production, and recording arts pathway that we are um, bringing to New School in a collaboration with El Sistema. So El Sistema, as you are well aware of, is an incredible organization. Their instructor has built great relationships with the students at New School and will be the instructor for this new pathway. It has a great set of partners to go with it. We have approved courses and that um, will be kicking off this year. We have a partnership with Universal Audio. There's state-of-the-art equipment in the classroom. Um, the grant funding and LCAP goal two monies for New School help to fund that and um, we're very excited to get that off the ground this fall. Next. Um, at Aptos High School through a very special grant through the California Department of Education called Specialized Secondary Programs. We were awarded a four-year grant to build an engineering pathway, which is an engineering technology pathway, and it's called Land, Sea, Air, and Space. We're partnered with Joby Aviation, UCSC, and Cabrillo College. The first class starts this fall. It is... Um, an engineering class with a lot of hands-on building of drones and robots and programming is woven into that. Fully grant funded and we also have a grant to extend it to an additional high school in the fall of 24. So this is our, for lack of a better word, it's our pilot year for a drone program. Um, to pilot it, it's our shakedown cruise, and then we will um, be looking at probably either Watsonville or PV High as an expansion to it in the following year. And then the second class is air and space. So get ready for rockets and um, exciting things happening there. Trips to Vandenberg to watch launches and, and things like that as we inspire our students. Um, the third one is um, we have programming pathways at Watsonville High School and PV High School. No computing to date at Aptos High School. So this year, um, our incredible um, building and construction trades instructor, Dustin Dennis, who is also has um, a credential in this area, is going to be offering AP Computer Science Principles, which is a very entry level computing class that is uh, meant for sophomores and above. And in the second year, we're looking at either a second AP course, students could move on to the engineering pathway from this particular course, or a dual enrollment math class through Cabrillo College. Um, uh, Mr. Redford and I are, talked about that yesterday. It's called discrete math. That's as strong as I am in math. He could talk more about what that means, but it actually is a good fit as a second um, course for this pathway. So um, staff respectfully recommends your approval of this item, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have none. Do we have any discussion from the board? Um, Go ahead. As, as one of the um, supporters and advocates who's had the opportunity to travel to D.C. and advocate for continued funding for our CTE program, it's very near and dear to my heart. Um, 
and thank you for the work you're doing. Thanks. A huge supporter of it. And um, with that, I'm going to make a motion to approve this agenda item. So, well, I'm going to jump in and second that. As, um, as a parent who's got a kid who, like, this is, this is the kind of thing that lights him up. And this is a, you know, this is a kid who didn't get lit up a whole lot in the last three years. Yeah. You know, and I, I know that what I'm seeing in my own household. I know a lot of our families are seeing that. And what I talked about in my you know, opening comments is it's like, this is what I get excited about with our district. Yeah. You know, like what we are doing, what, where we are making these successes. So I, I will happily second that motion. Do we have any other discussion? Uh, Trustee DeSerpa? Yeah, I just have a comment. So this will be at Aptos High, um, PB in Watsonville. Are there kids, will they have access to this program? Or do we have a plan to roll it out in those other two schools? Or what, can you say more about that? Are you referring to the land, sea, air, and space? Mm -hmm. We'll scale that in the fall of 24 to an additional school site, yes. And depending on when it's placed in the school day, it's possible that we can, we can um, have some access for for the school where it isn't you know That's what great. I mean yeah what's the dollar amount over four years again oh gosh it's just shy that. of a half a million dollars mm -hmm. um, and it's paced out over the over four and a half years the first year was a planning year the year we just finished and the two teachers that are be going to be teaching the course wrote the course and the curriculum did tons of research and um, have been flying drones to practice what they're going to be teaching the students so yeah. Can I just add in response to Ms. DeSerpa, uh, just remember Watsonville High, I'm not objective, is full of academies. There were three academies in 2006. There were a f uh, seven academies in 2008. So every student at Watsonville was placed in pathways that were very rich and very connected to the core curriculum. I believe the Engineering uh, Academy is no longer in existence, which right. is tragic. But right. just I think one high school is really a model, and that Julie is just doing a sensational job of coalescing funds from Sacramento, bringing in our folks in the community, um, and it is spreading. Thanks. But I had to say that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Well, we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, op any opposed? No? And, but, and one abstention. Okay. It's still a 7 0 vote, like a 7 0. He works for LC State. So 6 0 1. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, item 9.4, uh, PVUSD Sunshine Proposal to California School Employees Association Chapter 132 for the 2023 24 school year. Clint, take it away. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Shackman. So this is our Sunshine Proposal, so the district Sunshine pr Proposal. You may remember on July 12th, we received the one from CSA. This is now the district's proposal of what articles we want to open. This is a reopener year, so we can choose up to three articles. Right now, the only one we're selecting is Article 8, which is hours and overtime. So we're asking the board to approve this so that we can begin negotiations with CSA, which I believe our first meeting is August 21st. Any public speakers to this item? We have none. Any discussion from the board? I have a question. Um, why out of the four separate articles that they presented to us, are we only selecting to pick one to reopen at this time? So they select, they select their own articles, we select our own. The what, reason we selected this one is, um, as you know, we just had a full contract open with them, so we actually hit transportation, a lot of the ones we wanted to do. One of the ones that held us up last year was Article 8, Hours and Overtime. There's some changes we want to make. Mm -hmm. CSCA was gracious enough to do an MOU with us to kind of get us through. Um, you, the board may remember one of the pieces that was being talked about was how we um, offer out overtime, especially when it's related to one-time funding. Because there's a lot of times individuals will want to use comp time, but when it's one-time funding, that funding is only available to a certain piece. So if you do it as comp time and they want to get it paid out after the one-time funding's gone, we no longer have the money. So there was just some pieces of clarification. CSEA has been very good about understanding where we're coming from that. It was just too hard to close out that one article last year so it's really the one we're bringing back from last year that was the one of the biggest ones for us that we wanted to just kind of yeah. <laughs> yeah 
sorry, that was just distracting. It distracted oh. me too. Um, sorry. Uh, so good, I appreciate that clarification. With regards to the other three that we approved, that they presented to us, mm -hmm. there's potential that we will. Those that are those all open. Yeah. They so, are open. So they open. Oh, sorry. It's okay. They open theirs, and they can bring. Um, now those to the table, we get to choose our own three. So the only one we really want, we wanted to bring was hours and overtime. They may have, did they also do hours and overtime? They may have. They did. They and did the reason we do it as well is if they want to withdraw it, we still actually have some pieces in it that we want to talk about. So that's the reason we're opening that one from our side. So just for clarification, does it mean the other three are not getting discussed because no, that was they, approved? They have every right to discuss those, yes. Okay. Um, so with regards to... Um, Article 14 that they brought forward last time. I missed making a comment on this on pay and allowances. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I've, sa I've said it publicly many times to many. Um, so I just want to take the opportunity to state it here. Um, with regards to pay and allowances, right, Pajaro Valley Unified School District is the second largest employer in the county, the largest employer in the city of Watsonville, right? I think there's a huge problem in our district that we have employees, and it's not just classified employees, there's teachers as well in this district that are making less than $20 an hour. And I, I, I just think that's part of a conversation that this board needs to have when we realize that we are competing with seven Starbucks in Watsonville, going on eight, and we're the largest employer. We, and it's arguable, arguable to even say that $20 an hour is a livable wage in this community. So I think I mean, that's just sort of really my ambition and goal as a trustee sitting here to see that we can somehow get there and whatever decisions need to be made as a board because I just do not think it is at all appropriate that we have any employee in this district making less than $20 an hour. So that's just part of, you know, my piece to that to the clarification. I appreciate all your clarification on that. Um, again, I've, I think I've already made a motion to approve it. So, and thank you and look forward to the ongoing conversations about this. Thank you. So thank you. Just to clarify, you move to approve. Yes. Excellent. Uh, do we have a second? second? I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, 9.5, approve the variable term waiver request uh, for a social science teacher, Brian Saxton, our human director of human resources. For All Oscar. right, good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Sheckman. I am Brian Saxton, director of HR. So I'm here tonight to ask for your approval for a variable term waiver for Manuel Contreras to teach social science uh, at EA Hall Middle School. This waiver is used when a, a prospective teacher has not finished all of their final credentialing and is getting ready to go into an intern program. Allows him to have a year of teaching while he gets himself into an intern program. So I would ask for your approval. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have none. Any discussion from the board? I make okay. a motion to approve, sorry. Okay, I have a motion. And a second. I, I have a question. And we have a you question. <laughs> I'm sorry, just jump in real quick. Do you know, Brett, um, how, how many um, variable waivers we are currently are going to be having going into this school year? This is the only one we have so far. Okay, yeah. thank you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. All right. Going on to 9.6, approve the appointment of teachers on provisional interim permits. And it's still you. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees. Superintendent Schuckman, yeah, I'm here again uh, to ask for you to approve. Uh, we have um, five teachers that are on provisional internship permits that we're requesting. Uh, these permits allow these teachers to teach under a credential as they uh, finalize their enrollment into an intern program. These are one-year permits, um, and so we would ask that you would approve these. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have none. Any board discussion? Uh, question are these the only five that we have no we do have other um, what are called short-term staff permits as well as a few more provisional internship permits that are going through the process so they have to meet with the county and we had a meeting last week where he came to us and then we have a few that weren't able to make it so they go through the county we check out all their 
transcripts, make sure they have everything they need, and then he approves them, and then we bring them to you. Do you know about how many of those there are? We probably have um, another seven total combined. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. I'll mm -hmm. make a motion to approve. Second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. And now we're on to 9.7, <laughs> the Williams Uniform Complaint Quarterly Report. Um, quarter four, April, May, and June. Good evening, you? President Home Board Trustees and Superintendent Sheckman. Um, I'm here this evening uh, to present the quarterly Williams um, complaints for the period of April 1st through June 30th. During this time period, there were zero Williams complaints. And with that, I ask for your approval of the uh, report. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have none. Any discussion from the board? All right. I'll second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. All right. I've got 9.8, approve agreement with Ever Driven uh, for Student Transportation Services. Uh, that's Katie. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Sheckman. My name is Katie Bajazi. I'm the Director of Transportation. And before you tonight, I have a contract with Everdriven. Um, it is a car service company, much like Adroit, um, that can be used to transport students who cannot use the yellow school bus for a variety of reasons. And um, before you, I uh, request your approval of this contract. Um, it would be used only uh, to um, like when Adroit is unable to accommodate our needs or um, when they don't have a driver, um, this would be an additional resource. So it wouldn't be um, adding to Adroit, it would just be in place of Adroit when they are unable to accommodate our needs. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have none. Uh, any discussion from the board? Make a, a motion. Uh, oh, sorry. We have a motion, a motion and then Trustee Scott. I have a question. Sure. Uh, do you know how much their drivers get paid? I do not know how much their drivers get paid. I mean, that's no. Uh, I'll still support it, but I'm still we, we curious. Find out. <laughs> Is that a second? Can I get a second? Yeah, I'll second. All right, I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Um, going on to 9.9, .9, approve notice of award for the fencing installation at Cesar Chavez Middle School. Uh, Lindo, take it away. Good evening, President Holm, Superintendent Sheckman, Board of Trustees, Cabinet. My name is Erlindo Fernandez and I'm here to ask for the approval for the installation project, the fencing installation project at Cesar Chavez. This is, um, there's a misprint on this um, agenda. It is a uh, endowment, not Major L, bond. Just clarifying that. And I'm here to ask for the approval for, to continue with the contract with Olivera fencing for the amount of 37430 to finish the installation fencing project at Cesar Chavez Middle School. All right, do we have any public uh, discussion on this item? We have none. Any board discussion? I'll make a motion, motion to approve. I have a motion, can I have a second? A second. I have a first and a second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. All right, uh, item 9.10, approve notice of award for the Rio de Mar Elementary School's ramp and stairs replacement project. Go ahead. Good evening, it's me again. I'm here to ask for the approval for the, this is an ESSER project that we're doing over at Rio de Mar Elementary School. It's the stairs and ramps. This project is, we had a, on a June 9th, on June 16, the district advertised the Real de Mar Elementary School ramp and stairs upgrades. A mandatory bid was held on June 20th, 2023. Six contractors were present. On July 7th, 
the district received two sealed bids from the following contractors. JPD Designs Incorporated with the amount of 384,000 and Premier Builders for the amount of $2,089,254. As you can see, JP Designs was the lowest bidder, but there was they were unresponsive. Uh, their bid, they, they weren't pre-qualified as as every time we have a project go over a million dollars, they get a, they need to be pre-qualified, and also his number was way off. He f he didn't bid on the whole project, so that's he was deemed unresponsive. So I'm here to ask for the approval to continue with the project with Premier Builders for the amount of two million eighty nine thousand two hundred fifty four dollars for the real Demar stairs project right. do we have any public speakers to this item we have none um, and thank you for clarifying that because I when I saw that estimate Biggest. I'm like I know how much we were estimating before and yeah. really <laughs> I thought so, somebody just dropped a zero. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we tried. We tried to ask him, "Did you forget a one or a two in front of that?" Right. And he said, "Oh, I don't know what happened." So he went back to his office and. Oh boy. Yeah. Okay. Well, I am so pleased that this is finally coming to the board. You know, I mentioned in uh, you know my opening comments just how long I've been a PBSD parent, and um, those stairs have been less than delightful for a long time. <laughs> so. The, the Rio students, family, staff, you know, uh, will be most appreciative to have this work done. So, so I will, I would love to make a motion to approve this. It's a well needed project. Yeah. Second, and Erlindo, I'd also like to thank you for, um, after the name of the bidder, that you put the address and where they're from because that helps me know how many of these contracts are going to lo our local um, agencies and companies. So thank you for that. You're welcome. All right, I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. All right. We've got one more. All right, approve um, Eleazar and Bayog Design Studio Inc. An agreement uh, for the Pajaro Middle School HVAC Replacement Phase Two project. So this is another ESSER funded project. This project is estimated at 950 thousand dollars and I'm here to ask for the approval for EB designs a local architect company that's going to help us with the bid uh, biddable set of drawings to go out to bid for the phase two H back replacement project of Pajaro Middle School their dollar amount would be a hundred and forty thousand dollars and I'm asking for the board to approve this so we could continue with this project. All right, do we have any public speakers to this item? We have none. Any discussion from the board? Uh, no, you don't. Trustee Soto? Yeah, I just have a question for clarification. Her, this project isn't in the scope of the flood. This is a pre-prescribed project that needed to get done for the site? Correct. Uh, the first phase was it's part of the flooding that happened, and this is in the library wing, which this HVAC didn't get affected with the flood, but it's in desperate need of a new HVAC system there. So, so if we're going to do it, we might as well do all of it, right? Yeah, correct. Right. Thank you. <laughs> and I'll make a motion to support. Thanks. I'll second. Oh. I'll second. <laughs> yeah, for a second. Okay, Spartacus. <laughs> All right, so we've got a first and a second. And I just wanted to add to my, my second because I said it first. Um, <laughs> I just, I know I said it in my opening comments, but I just wanted to say it again and commend you and your team and all the work you're doing over the summer. I know it's a busy time of year for you, I, and I'm just really appreciative of all the work you and your team are doing in improving our schools during this time. Thank you. I'll pass it along. Thank you. All right, we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. All right, so we will go on to item 9.12, which is a great date, by the way. Uh, further planning related to the search for the permanent superintendent 
report will be presented for by uh, Marie Sheckman. Right, Thank you. I guess we just found, or I just found out when your birthday is. <laughs> These are really board items. I work with them on the board agenda committee, and um, they had good discussion on the board agenda committee about the use of, uh, in my mind, that these two board, uh, these two items are linked. But the discussion at this time uh, on 912 is basically, do you want to use, now that's the next item, y you want to talk more about, and I sense it's community involvement in the search for a permanent superintendent. So the 912 is, we're going to hear discussion from our board, questions of each other, um, and then the next item will be to if 912 goes in the flow to 913, the next item will be to determine the use of August 9th, that board meeting. That board meeting, the agenda that was published, indicated it was uh, the time to evaluate uh, Dr. Rodriguez. Well, the board realizes they don't need to do that. That's going to happen in, in another city. So they have an option, and they're going to discuss now, about the use of that date, the next item, related to the search for a permanent superintendent. In other words, moving the process a little sooner than later. We've got an open date, but I guess we need to wait for 912 to have that one, or 913. So I will be quiet and turn it back to our president. Uh, do we have any public speakers to this item? We have none. All right. So we do need to, whether or not we use the 9th or not, we do need to determine you know, what date we have the kickoff meeting for um, leadership associates and in you know in looking at the leadership associates proposal like the kickoff meeting is fairly straightforward you know the pur pur purpose of that meeting is for the board to set the pace and process of the superintendent search you know we'll finalize the timeline um, verify you know contact information to so exchange information with leadership associates and clarify anything about the process that we might still have questions about the biggest advantage that I see about possibly having that meeting on the 9th is having that initial board discussion about those three key questions that were outlined in their proposal that you know what are the desired characteristics the board would like to observe in the next superintendent what are the strengths of the district what are the challenges of the district and these are the same questions that will be raised at the stakeholder meetings holding the kickoff meeting sooner rather than later gives our community an opportunity to see where we as a board are at in our thinking. And if we have that now in the stakeholder meetings, you know, after the start of the school year, this gives folks plenty of time to consider that initial conversation and to respond as they feel is appropriate. And I have heard from some stakeholders and some fellow trustees, of course, you know, that there's a desire to wait until later in August or even possibly September as more people will be around. However, I've also heard from you know, members of the community that once school begins, attending a meeting or even watching becomes even more challenging as they're trying to you know, figure out the, you know, schedules and on all that. And, you know, Vice President Acosta, you raised a concern about a lack of transparency by holding it sooner. And I want to applaud your advocacy for transparency in all of our processes. I think that's so important. I think we can address that concern. This will be a public meeting with two weeks' notice. We can live stream it, make a recording available for review. And of course, the minutes will be posted publicly. And regardless of when we hold that meeting, I hope that stakeholders will either attend or watch you know, at a time that is convenient to them, and then provide us with feedback so that you know, we can ensure that we are representing our community as we were elected to do. Um, at our last meeting, you, know, you also advocated for having our stakeholder meetings in as wide a geographic representation as possible, and again, I, I applaud and totally agree with that. Um, I would encourage this board to expand that advocacy to include this one meeting before the frenzy of the school year to accommodate those in our community who do find it challenging to attend when school is in session. You know, um, this would also give our community more lead time to plan around like when those stakeholder meetings will be. I've had a chance to discuss options with leaders of our unions, with our interim superintendent, other education leaders in our area, and community members. And overall, you know, I feel like this kickoff meeting on the 9th, as you know, I, I see it as a way for the board to put our cards on the table 
um, and let the community see where we're thinking. And you know, this is a critical process, and I want them to know where we're at. And we can use this as an opportunity to broaden, you know, opportunities for engagement, and to ensure that our community has plenty of time to respond um, as we move forward into the active phase of that permanent search. So I would like to move that we hold the kickoff meeting on the 9th of August. Is there any other discussion from the board? Um, thank you, President, uh, Trustee Dr. Holm, uh, for your comments. So um, you were almost successful with reputing almost every um, input that I made um, on this topic in both the last public board meeting and in agenda setting committee meeting. Um, and I still fullheartedly disagree with you. Um, feedback that we've heard here in this board meeting from the um, union leadership as well as also conversations I've had with um, one of our union leadership members um, as well as other community members is the, the, the desire to have not only the, the transparency component but the active input of our community throughout this entire process. And the phase one meeting with the board um, is more entailed than the, the three things you highlighted. It's about reviewing the search process, discuss collectively with the board the characteristics desired in the new superintendent, which you mentioned, the strengths and challenges with the district, which you mentioned, also co includes community staff input process and online surveys, search protocols and agreements, and to finalize the timeline. I th my feeling with the August 9th, it is before all community stakeholders are back in session um, not just employees, but students and their families. Um, but I also do believe that this is a very important um, item and it deserves its own time and space. Um, actually, to quote CSBA um, cites that one of the most important decisions and choices that any governing school board in the state of California out of nearly 1,100 that exist, that they make is the hiring of the superintendent. So it is a very important decision. It's very important to have that community process. As I had mentioned in the agenda setting committee, when we have a board meeting in the public, there's time for the public to come and be present. My position is still to hold that we do that at a time when all stakeholders are back in place. So I would be of line that that meeting, and I also do again, I think it, it needs to not be jam-packed into another board meeting full of a bunch of other stuff. I think it deserves its own time and space. So I would be of more the incline that we move it to when everyone's back, so not August 23rd, but you know the, either the following Wednesday after that, the um, August 30th, or September 6th that we call for an, another special meeting and have it then, and have it be the only agenda item for that. To clarify, August 9th was a special study session to evaluate the superintendent, and that was the only other agenda item right. that we're currently talking about is, you know, discussing arts. Right. No, no, no. no. I'm, what I am saying is I, I won't support having it on August 9th. Okay. I, will, I will not support that whatsoever. It is before our stakeholders are all back in session, which is August 15th. I don't support having it on August 23rd, which is our regular board meeting. Okay, I got that. I and thought you were saying that the, the right. ninth. Right. So I, 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 I support understand. having it, but I do think it is important, and I support having the public input when all stakeholders are back. Whether stakeholders show up or not, that's on them, but we've done our part as a board, and so I support looking at doing it, um, having a special board meeting on September 6th. I won't support having it on August 9th or August 23rd. Do we have any further board discussion? Well, Jen, I'd like to second um, your motion. Um, I agree with you completely. August 9th is the perfect time to, to start this process um, with leadership and associates. There will be multiple, many other meetings um, where we'll all have to come together. And this is simply um, a meeting to go over the process. And so um, I do agree with you that this is a nice time to get this um, search kicked off. So um, I appreciate your comments and um, 
and I think it's quiet now. There's nothing else on the agenda that night, and we just have leadership come and tell us what the process is. There'll be lots and lots of time for community and stakeholder input um, in the process. Do we have any other board discussion? Yes, Trustee Flores. I'd like to thank you for bringing this uh, to the agenda tonight. Um, I think it's good that we have a conversation all together to decide on a date, um, just so because I would like to make it as accommodating as possible that the majority of us would be in attendance. I was surprised to see you know, an email saying this day or this date, and I just not thinking, said, okay, this date, but then I'm thinking about it, like what if four said yes, it's th you know, so what would the decision have been? Three people don't get, you know, so I like that we do it this way, you know, all together, let's figure out a date that works best for all of us. Um, and I agree that it should be um, after all of our stakeholders do return. Um, and I also, one of the dates that was proposed is the first week of school being a mom of three kids in the district. That is not a good week for me personally. Um, just getting back into the rhythm and flow of things, it takes a while. And so that's personally why I would like to push it back a little more. But again, I'm just thankful that we're having this discussion all together as a board to pick this date. Trustee Dodge Jr. Thank you, you know, thank you very much for your words and you know, your, your motion. But I also disagree as well. Uh, school doesn't start until August 15th. Teachers are on vacation, classified workers are on vacation. They, des they deserve to be heard. So I will be voting no on this motion and I support the August 26th date. August 20th, okay. Uh, and I, I, just, we, we have a motion in a second we can talk about if that sure, fails, I just want to provide a clarification because that is a misprint on the agenda. It says August 26th. It says August 26th, but our next board meeting is August 23rd after the 9th. Okay. Yeah, that's a misprint. I did notice that. Yeah, I agree that uh, we do need to have some preliminary conversations to understand the process. And you know, like Trustee DeSerpa said, there will be more time for input down the road. It, this isn't going to be a rush situation as it's being uh, presented. Um, we do need to get oriented with the agency that's going to help us do this and if it's if we use that time wisely that night for that specific reason alone without making any uh, drawing any conclusions prior to that um, I'm in support for the August 9th date further comments trustee Scow I'm just looking at the, their text on phase one and I see both arguments. Um, I, I, I could agree with both of you, but when I see that there's a lot of things in here that, are, that I make me feel that we should wait a little bit longer as a way they're proposing phase one. I'm not gonna read out the whole paragraph, but it's reading in front of me. Uh, possible contract parameters with the new superintendent, potential internal candidates, uh, I mean with board members individually, community process, that, that makes me think it's, we, c we can wait a little bit. So what we, what we could talk to leadership associates about is like limiting it, because what they clarified was that it was the, what they had in that bullet for that phase one. You know, so we could say, it's like we, wanna, we don't wanna go beyond, you know, what I outline, you know, as those discussions. So, you know, have it really be that orientation, but it's like having that orientation, I think it's really important to start start the discussion. Yeah, I, w I would I would like to hear specifics on <laughs> getting really specific on what how that would break out. Right, but the way that we have here the specifics is that we meet with leadership and associates. So, if we don't have an orient if we don't have a kickoff meeting with them, then right, you then don't get no to way, hear. Yeah, there's no way so to then know. We, we, the other thing is then we'll have to have three meetings in the month of 
I mean, in a short period of time. If you guys want to do that, that's. I, I would just rather do it in a in a more timely fashion. Because one of the because one of the things is with. Um, I'm sorry, I jumped in. That's Tuskegee okay. To Serpa, did you? No, you done? that's okay. I'll finish my thought in a second. So. We're not wedded. To you know, we're not wedded to a specific thing in that discussion. This is it's an orientation. It's where we start the conversation. It is where we have that initial, okay, this is where we're thinking, but it's not, it's not, we talk about, talk about a timeline, but there's flexibility beyond that point. So if we don't start talking to this firm, then we don't get the more more information that you want to start talking to the firm. Yeah, I hear. I, I hear what you're saying. I I just have a lot of. So how are we? Um, how many? Is there a limitation on how many meetings we're going to have with them, or how many times it can come? I no. can't remember. No. This you'll is, this you'll is see just, them a lot. Yeah, this is just the this is just the initial kickoff meeting where we start the discussion, and it's like part of, the big part of it is clarifying the process. So this is the, so, a lot of the questions that you have. That's what this meeting is for. I don't, but I, I do feel slightly uncomfortable determining the process that early. I don't, like in some ways, talking it, like starting to talk about the process is one thing, but to just say, oh, that's my, that without being specific, it's just making decisions that early makes me uncomfortable. It, okay. That's your job, Adam. You're on a board now, right? I mean, I know you don't maybe don't feel comfortable making those decisions, but they know how to do the process. This is what they do. So they're just going to explain it and teach us how it how it goes and then we get to make comments, right, on on the process and they'll give us different maybe different ways that they've seen districts do it, but we we can't even start anything until they come and talk to us about it. So, if Nothing big is going to be decided on that day. They're just, it's an orientation to the process. In terms of so if, if you look at it in terms of what that meeting is going to be about, it's going to be the same meeting on the 26th or further down the road. I mean, that, that's how I see it. We either do this now, get it out of the way, get familiar with the process, and take it from there. Or we wait till a later date just to do the same thing but further down the road. I, I would I would just like to also add that, you know, one of the things one of the things I've learned uh, in my job as a nurse is that you do what you can when you can because you don't know what's coming down the road. This we have the time already set aside. It's like in the, our next agenda item is to what are we going to do with the, the, the you know the ninth, okay? So we have a meeting where we've already committed to being. We have the time to be here. We have an agreement with this firm. We can start the process start the engagement with our community, start the conversation with our, our, our stakeholders, and start to learn about you know, how this all works. If, here's what I could live with for the ninth. If they want to make a presentation to us with some suggestion, like giving us an idea about but I'm not comfortable taking action on the ninth. But if they want to start the process and make a presentation, without 
not as an action. I'm not going to be comfortable taking action, but I'm not. I don't oppose them coming up with their idea of what it could be, and then maybe that's something for a basis for us to discuss in a bigger forum later on. That's that's something I could live with. So um, I just wanted to add back um, <laughs> that based on the um, what they gave us. They said at this phase one initial meeting with the board, review the search process, discuss collectively with board, characteristics desired a new superintendent, district strengths and challenges, community staff input process, online survey, search protocols and agreements, finalize timeline. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight items. I do not understand this adamant push to do that when our stakeholders haven't returned and they are a huge part of this process. So everyone can make their own decisions here um, I've said it once I'll say it again I do not support the motion that's been put forward I do not support having this meeting on August 9th I also don't support having it it's not August 26th it would be August 23rd which is a regular board meeting um, I do believe it deserves its own time and space so I would support having it on either August Wednesday August 30th or September 6th and that's where I'm gonna stand great uh, thank you for reiterating that and it, like I said, if, if you look at the, the item, it's talking about discussing it collectively and it's talking about a timeline. The only potential action is like looking at a timeline. It's not making any determination beyond. It's like, okay, our next meeting will be here. That, you know, we're gonna, we, we would like to consider having stakeholder meetings at this point. That, So, and I, you know, I think we all feel the same is we want leadership and associates and we can direct them because this is their job and we are the board. Our job is to hire a new superintendent. Their job is to help us, help lead us through that process. So if we want more stakeholder input or a certain group, like we get to direct that. They'll tell us how they do it, and that might suffice. You might say, yeah, that sounds great. Or you might say, hey, but don't forget blah, blah, blah. You know, So you know, I think that this first meeting is just an orientation to the process. And um, I, I feel like we've already dragged our feet on this and, and um, made this process longer than it needs to be. And I think we've missed out on probably some good candidates. <laughs> already and so I, I do believe that we need to get going there's a lot of work ahead of us still okay we, yes well I, I disagree with the last part of that um, but it's okay we can disagree about some things um, one of the other I've heard from numerous administrators and one of the other consulting firms agreed that the best candidates come in January and February and so I don't think we're in a rush and Fortunately, we have an excellent inter interim. If we had an, and we didn't have a good interim, I would probably be more sympathetic to your argument. So, I th we're gonna. I'm kind of. I know it feels like there's a conflict here, but I'm really saying yes to all of you. I know there's a there's a, a disagreement about the ninth, but I, I don't feel comfortable make giving direction on the ninth. I'm willing to consider a proposal, some ideas from them that can begin our thinking as to what we want. But when it comes to giving direction, pro all that stuff, I think that can wait just a little bit. We're going to be okay. Okay. So we have the first and the second. And so it's, there's nothing in what I'm seeing in phase one, like beyond, are, are you comfortable looking at, like having a discussion about the timeline in because that's part that was part of the the, the motion. A discussion, meaning I'm I'm open to discussing things with them with the board on the ninth, but I'm I i do not want to be making decisions that night. Okay. All right, that's fine. I don't know how 
you can pigeonhole that with that if there's a meeting and say that there can't be direction discussion and I mean there could be discussion but no direction I don't think that way you put your motion forward that does that um, first and foremost so that that I'm very vague on that um, and again I, I'm still gonna say I don't see the rush in waiting a potentially two extra weeks I, I really don't see that when all stakeholders are back in session I don't get that I really don't get that from anyone who would vote to support that in any other direction that's just totally absurd to me I get in your that. role as an elected official or an appointed one so we have a first and a second I'll ask the roll call the vote so Sorry. is do you have a clarification on your so are you, how, how yeah. would you are, are you proposing an amendment? Like, I'm, I'm comfortable having a discussion about this, with, with, but not as an action item. So, okay. is that so, so, uh, so you're requesting that the special board meeting on the ninth. If if we have it on the ninth, that it be a report and discussion item, and not an action item. Is that when correct? it comes to the ninth? Mm -hmm. I know that's the next item. I don't, we always have twenty to thirty items. I can't imagine. No, the, the 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 ninth is was scheduled as a special board study can, session. Can we not amend it to be a regular meeting? Can, can I make a point of clarification? Uh, there was a previous agenda item related to art. That we come back yeah. on that day. Yeah. I was going to wait till the next agenda item, but I just want to point that out. But it, but the this topic could be a report and discussion item. Yeah, but not but it, but it it shouldn't. The concern I would have is that it 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 be considered. Any, like any, it, I, I'm okay with them sharing some of their thoughts with us, so we can take it to a larger meeting where I do agree with the, that. Before we get into the nitty gritty about making decisions, that mm -hmm. should be after the school session starts. But I don't want this to be considered, you know, like this is the phase one, like phase one. I see over taking place over a longer time. So if you look at the document that they provided, the phase, the phase one is, is is really just that initial kickoff and orientation, and the phase two is like where that 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 whole larger thing. If the motion is this phase one, then I can't support it. So, then yeah, we have a first. And a roll. Okay, we have a first and a second. All of those in favor. Oh, we'll call it right. Trustee Soto, your vote. Trustee Flores, your vote. No. Trustee Deserpa, your vote. Aye. Trustee Bolaños, your vote. No. Bolaños, no. Trustee Dodd, your vote. No. Trustee Acosta, your vote. No. Um, President Holm, your vote. Yes. All right, the motion fails. Um, so I, I, well, I, that motion failed, but I think that it, yeah, we still need to have a discussion about when we are going to have that meeting. So I'm not sure on the point of order, maybe Murray, you could clarify this. The motion failed. That doesn't mean that another motion can't be made in regards to this item. Okay. So I'd like to ask that we open this back to discussion to discuss maybe potentially having a, board, a special board meeting or a regular board meeting if need be. Um, maybe Murray could clarify for us whether which it, if it needs to be one or the other to either 
um, when all stakeholders are back in session, where this would be the only item for either Wednesday, August 30th or September 6th. They're both Wednesdays. saying I will not venture an opinion. I'll give you my views of the way Ms. Acosta asked the question, but I don't want to be in a conflict of interest. I'm your interim, I'm here at your discretion and your time, but I'm not going to venture an opinion on your timeline, and I hope you understand why. And again, I remind you, you have a group that you want to come back uh, on the 9th, I and mean, you can delay that but I just want to remind you of that. Well, I believe that's the next action item, 9.13. I think we're still in 9.1.2 because, yeah. right. I would like to make a motion that we take a look at August 30th. Is that, is that a Wednesday? Yes, it is. No. I, I just asked. And I just asked for it to be open to discussion to Wednesday, August 30th, or sep Wednesday, September 6th. All right, okay. we have a motion for August 30th. Do we have a second? A second. A point of order. Yes. Um, so we have a board meeting on the 23rd. Correct. And this would be a special study session on the 30th? Correct. Okay. All right, we have a first and a second. Any other discussion? Do you want a roll call vote for this one as well? I think we should. Trustee Dodd Jr., your vote? Aye. Trustee Soto, your vote? Aye. Trustee DeSerpa, your vote? Aye. Trustee Scow, your vote? Aye. Trustee Flores, your vote? Trustee Acosta, your vote? Aye. President Holm, your vote? Aye. All right, motion carries 7 0. Uh, moving on to item 9.13, agenda for August 9th, uh, 2023 meeting. And again, even though my name's on, this is really being driven, driven by the board, mm -hmm. it should be during our consent. During our and my wife wrote me and said, put on the microphone. Um, this is a, really a board initiated item. I was their note taker. And they're very interested in moving the timeline. We just made, they just made a decision about the 30th. So what do you want to do about the night? That's really what we're talking about now. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have none. <coughs> any discussion from the board? So, I think we should cancel this. I'll make a motion to cancel this meeting. Well, we did uh, talk about coming back on the 9th. No, for yes. VAPA. For VAPA. Yeah. Well, since none of our stakeholders seem to be in session, I think we need to push it out until everybody comes back. Wouldn't the board agree? Can I speak? Um, I think the reason I think we should meet on the 9th for VAPA is because we need to get this situated before we get back in session for school. And we have, the community has proven to us over the last three months, they're willing to show up. So the same argument that was just made about the superintendent search, now you're saying that the stakeholders are going to come out? For that VAPA, no yes. Sense. Yeah, okay. Well, yes. We seem we never seem to have a shortage of agenda items for our meetings, and it's hard to imagine that there aren't any other items needed to be brought up for, that could be brought up for August ninth. Um, so, I would suggest why can't we just make it a regular meeting, even if there's only one or two or three items? I'm sh doesn't that give us the flexibility to have more items? Uh, we have a, a comment. Yeah. Yes, the one thing that I did want to make is on the following day on um, August 10th is our district-wide SBC day where we will have um, a thousand teachers that we are preparing to bring back yeah. um, in attendance. 
So I think what I'm understanding is that that would present some challenges for uh, having a regular board meeting? Yes, if it went late, um, because yeah. we want to make sure that we are um, prepared for the following day. Yeah. I don't mind having a short meeting, but it just if we make it a regular board meeting, if there's a couple other agenda items, knock them out in an hour. Uh, so I would propose making it a regular meeting, giving us some flexibility. And if it's very short, that's okay. Or we, you know, okay. Well, okay. we have a first, to, we have a, f a motion to cancel the meeting. We have that on the oh. floor. Do we have a second? Okay, the motion dies for a lack of a second. Make a motion. I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I would encourage, I think, I would encourage, keep, if we're going to have this, the, the meeting on the 9th, I would encourage keeping it to VAPA. Just, <laughs> just ha have, it, have the focus be on that if that's what we're wanting to do. I'm, I'm okay with that too. I just want, thought, might want a little flexibility, but I'm, I, I just kind of. I, I have a question on that meeting. Don't we usually start that at 6? Yes. So we could still start it at 6. Yes. As a special meeting. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Let's just stick to the task at hand. We've, we've uh, committed to VAPA for that night, so Starting let's just hold to that. So did Trustee Milano Scala make a motion? I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm unclear. I was about to. I'm happy to make one. That okay. to have April, August 9th is purposed as a VAPA meeting. And start at 6 p.m. Let's do it. Okay. So we have a first. Do we have a second? Excuse me, we have a comment from Assistant Superintendent. Earlier the direction was VAPA science. Um, it is. I just wanted to, I just wanted to make yeah. sure because the motion yeah. did not include. Yeah. That. Uh, will, you take a, will you take a friendly amendment? Yeah, yeah. clarification, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's consistent with the previous. Thank you. Action. Thank you for that clarification. I'll, I'd like to second that. Oh, motion. hell yeah. Okay. All right, we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. So motion carries 6-1. All right, going on to a you know, um, point of order, it's 10 o'clock. Um, just to make sure we have enough time to get through our various items, I would like to move to um, extend the meeting till 11.30. Second. Uh, first and second, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion. <laughs> you don't get the vote. <laughs> Motion carries 7-0. Uh, All right. Um, moving on to item 10.1, our PBUSD Family Engagement and Wellness Center update and report. Good evening, President Home, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Sheckman, and PBUSD community. Uh, my name is Ben Sider, I'm coordinator of student services and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to share our progress of the PBUSD Family Engagement and Wellness Center. Uh, within this presentation, I plan to revisit the, hor the historical context of the Wellness Center, uh, share data from the 2022-23 school year and provide some program updates uh, as well. So just uh, to uh, ground ourselves, um, as always, we are anchored in the with our LCAP goals, and specifically when we think about the Wellness Center, we're talking about parent and family engagement. Uh, but m moving forward into the next year, we also know that we have uh, an LCAP goal that's in that's uh, related to improving foster youth academic uh, performance uh, attendance and graduation. And so that will be also something that will be one of our fo focus uh, as well. As you know, the, the Wellness Center does work uh, closely with our PVUSD Healthy Start program, and it would make sense that um, we're also providing and supporting those efforts as well. As a reminder, um, in the, year, the school year 2021-22, PBUSD expanded its definition of student success from whole child to whole child, whole family, and whole community. 
Um, the expanded definition of student success meant that we as a district needed to prepare ourselves to be uh, responsive to wraparound needs of our students uh, that we serve. And in doing so, we looked at our systems to determine if we could truly support each student and in their individual development. We understood and recognized that uh, limitations and challenges families face highly impact our students and community as a whole. And we leveraged, valued, and included uh, the voices, assets, and experiences of our entire community. The Family Engagement and Wellness Center was opened December 2021 as a way to meet PVUSD's goal to increase family and community engagement and create a space and programming to support students, families, well-being, community-friendly. And I want to make sure that um, I repeat that, community-friendly. So the PVUSD Family Engagement and Wellness Center has become one important part of a multitude of systems uh, and processes that run simultaneously to offer wraparound services to our students to support achievement. And as you can see from this um, particular slide, just as an example, um, along with the Family Engagement Wellness Center, we um, operate and we collaborate with the Family Engagement Network which um, Seoul's purpose is to engage with families to improve student achievement, uh, as well as the various programmings that are happening at the school site level. So for example, our emotional, uh, our, our counselors, our, our social emotional counselors and support at each of the sites, PBIS initiatives, um, PVUSD, I'm sorry, PVPSA within uh, the sites, uh, as well as other programs like um, Healthier Generation. And just, I want to highlight this because it just goes to show how um, not only complex, but how important it is for our different uh, intra -depart department um, departments within PVUSD to work together along with our community to, to lift. And so I just want to just do a quick shout out of our 2022-23 Caring, Inspiring, and Strong um, community engagement initiative team. Um, in, in part of that, just a little bit of historical um, perspective on that, um, PVUSD Wellness Center has been the focal point in the collaboration within the CEI uh, team. PVUSD was accepted uh, to join the cohort um, prior to the start of the pandemic. The pandemic happened, we were distance learning, um, and then we were able to re-engage afterwards um, through distance learning with them, or you know, kind of a, a distance sort of remote um, way of collaborating. The work done since PVUSD joined cohort two has led us to refine our problem of practice to reach, engage uh, PVUSD's most vulnerable families in collaboration with our ecosystem of supports. Um, and so just uh, a, a, our list of our community partners, as you can see, are many of the same community partners that we work with um, within the Wellness Center, along with our students, parents, and our PVUS team that were involved, which included district um, people as well as site uh, employees too. Focusing a little bit more on our Family Engagement Wellness Center, when we first reported out last fall, um, our um, people might have looked slightly different. And so we have some new faces that I want to make sure that um, I highlight here. So uh, Marielle Zuniga is our administrative assistant. Um, Marisol Arenas is our community service liaison. Um, we had updated that position to community service liaison because we thought it was most appropriate for that site in their sole um, job is to really engage with families and parents and do that, um, that education. Uh, our mental health clinician is uh, Nancy Broxton and our second harvest food co-op co coordinator who runs the food co-op co is Abby Bart hand. Um, and again, so different faces from last year, uh, the previous year. So we're, we're now in the new year. Um, so it would be the 2021-22 uh, year, uh, different faces from that. 
Um, just as a reminder, um, if we describe what the Family Engagement Wellness Center is, it can be described as that one-stop shop of continuum care uh, and support for our students and families. We are providing direct access to PVUSD um, Healthy Start programs. Um, PVUSD Mental Health Clinician is on site and operating during those, um, those operational hours, which is from uh, 11 o'clock uh, to 7 o'clock Tuesday through Friday and on Saturdays it is uh, um, 9 o'clock to 4 o'clock and so our mental health uh, clinician is there on site as well. Our community partners are providing direct services, our food co-op uh, is open during operational hours and PVUSC agency staff provide information, connect services, referrals, meet with social, emotional, mental uh, f uh, physician health needs uh, for our families. And um, of course, you're already familiar with some of our um, services here. You can see that um, in our last report, we had about 12 um, partners that, that we had. We've grown since then. Our original startup uh, set of partners was four. Um, when we last reported, uh, the last uh, uh, in, in last July, we had 12, that's increased. And so our new services that we were able to bring in, um, uh, kind of going deeper with Community Action Board, we were able to bring in immigration legal consultation. Uh, we now have a partnership with Positive Discipline Community Resources, and so we're able to provide uh, those uh, parent classes and workshops that you were uh, willing to um, continue our uh, partnership for this next year as well. Uh, we have a partnership with uh, triple, our Triple P practitioners through uh, First Five of Santa Cruz County. Um, our second Harvest Food Bank is doing um, food demos, which uh, will show our families what kind of meals, what kind of dishes that they can create with the food that's being offered within the food co-op itself. Um, we launched our laundry token program, um, pilot program, and we're, you know, we're planning to continue with that. Uh, we were able to bring in Family Art Night with our partnership with uh, Arts Council of Santa Cruz County. And we also opened, we had an open house uh, as well, which we will continue to do that in. By the way, we're gonna hold two open houses moving forward into this next year. The first one will be in the fall. And information will come out, so you're more than welcome to um, attend that if you'd like, and we'll have one in the spring as well. New for the 23-24 school year, uh, we plan to increase the positive discipline parent um, workshops by 100%, um, very successful, and so, um, that is pro bono, so it's not costing uh, the school district anything to be able to do that. Um, and so that's great, and we had great responses from our, our parents and our community through that. We plan to put in a walk-in cooler, uh, the installate and installation, and that's in thanks to, to with the support of Second Harvest Food Bank, and also the Aron Sanchez Impact Fund as well. Uh, that we were able to create that partnership with. And then finally, we are planning to increase funding to our laundry token program this upcoming year as well. So as I mentioned before, um, ecosystem of partners. Um, the, the images that you see uh, above, the logos, are the existing partners that PVUSD has with, um, with, with our community. And so what we've done is either strengthen those partnerships or we've created new partnerships um, through the work that we did in this last year. And then this is the fun part. So we get to share some pictures. And as you can see, um, for Second Harvest, every first Saturday of uh, each month, we have a mass food distribution. It's open to the whole community. Uh, but what we see is about 70 to 80% of the participants that come through that RPV USD families that are participating. And there's some images there. Uh, there's our food co-op with uh, one of our parents um, doing some shopping and you can see that the shelves are always stocked. Um, continuing with family engagement, uh, the images over to the left are some images to our family art night that we had. Fantastic night, super fun. Um, and it was just awesome seeing uh, families and parents and, and their kids 
kind of working together and having fun um, in a very low risk, um, high fun uh, environment. Um, we continued with our frozen meals uh, with Mar Martha's Kitchen, and we're going to be negotiating, um, adding some, some more uh, boxes to each of our weekly orders as well, because we know that we need that. And then um, the images on the right uh, is uh, just some images from our open house that we had on May 19th. Um, Images on the left, we see Abby doing a cooking demo with some of our families that are, uh, you know, outside watching on, um, and uh, you know, continuing our partnership with Foods What uh, program, and that is, you know, uh, giving our um, PVUSD high school students the opportunity to learn the process of, you know, growing food, raising it, harvesting it, um, selling it, marketing it and seeing that whole process from start to finish. Uh, so we're continuing that process, and you know, that's our, our image that we have with, with that as well. And we continue with the small groups um, in uh, Module B as well. Uh, participating families, um, just some pictures around that. We also hold our Healthy Start collaborative team meetings there. Um, and um, an important piece to whole family, uh, whole student, whole family, whole community, is making sure that our high school students engage in their community um, through volunteer opportunities. And I wanted to make sure that the Wellness Center was a place for student volunteers to be able to uh, be there. Um, let me see, do we have enough time for this? Um, I don't know if we have enough time for this video, so I think I'm going to skip over it, but I would encourage um, anyone that has access to this uh, slideshow to take a look at the video. Um, just to let you know, it's Tatiana Ramos, who is a parent of PVUSD, does frequent the Wellness Center, and she's also part of the CEI um, PVUSD group. Um, this video was produced as a way to be able to show the public things about the Wellness Center, but we also shared this with a bunch of districts down south last January um, and worth taking a look at. Uh, so let's take a look at a little bit of data here. Um, who's accessing the uh, Wellness Center? When we look at it by schools, we can see that there are larger percentages of students um, in families of those students um, that are participating at the Wellness Center that are near the Wellness Center, so like EA Hall, Watsonville High School, um, Minty White um, are, are, are the few, and then we can see that it kind of, um, that those percentages are a little bit uh, less than that. Now one thing that um, this doesn't show is the difference between last year and this year. So the percentages, of course this is of 100%, right? And so the percentages have shifted, and EA Hall, Minty White, and Watsonville had a larger percentage. Those percentages went down. We now have slightly elevated percentages for the other schools. So what that's telling us is that the communication that's going out to the PVSD community is working because we're starting to see participation from other schools like McQuitty, Alianza, Hall, Rolling Hills. They were participating. Those numbers are slightly higher than last year. Taking a look at um, some of the services that are offered there, um, there's a slight amendment to this, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, as you can see, the food co-op um, gets the most traction there, uh, followed by our mental health clinician at 984 sessions. So that's 984 sessions over the course of the 22-23 school year. And then follow that, we have um, Martha's kitch uh, Kitchen frozen meals, so it's those frozen meals. Um, those frozen meals, the 906 occurrences that happened at the Wellness Center last year, equate to 7,625 meals that we were able to distribute to our families during that time. It's slightly elevated when the Pajaro funds had occurred, so we were able to ask for more. Martha's Kitchen gave us more, and we were able to respond to the, to the needs there. Um, but some newer numbers that we didn't share last time, Family Art Night. We had 114 participants throughout the, the year during those three sessions that we had. Um, our supports through PVPSA, 97 students, uh, uh, parents, 38. Student volunteers, it says 40, it, it should actually be 150. 
So we had 150 instances of, of PVUSD students volunteering at the Family Engagement and, and, and Wellness Center. So fantastic. Um, if we look at it by grade level, you can see that there's, there seems to be kind of that curve there. And as uh, families, um, you know, are, are participating at the Wellness Center, we see an elevated uh, number, some around fifth grade, sixth grade, little dip in seventh, same in eighth, and then it drops down, and then it goes up to, to 10. What this doesn't show is that when we do ask parents to give us information, we ask for a student ID. They can choose their fifth grader, they can choose their seventh grader, right? If they give us the fifth grader student ID, that's the one that gets um, put it into place. So we may not be capturing all of the data on this. We are capturing the family data, but in terms of students, we know that the families are much greater. And so this next slide is going to kind of give us a better understanding of that. So this particular slide, if we look at one of our larger metrics, which is the food co-op in the mass distribution, we can see that in the blue, in the blue itself, those are the households that are coming in and participating during those months. But the number of those households that are coming in equate to a number of individuals. So in one household, we might have four individuals that are benefiting from um, utilizing the food co-op, or it could be eight individuals that are utilizing from the food co-op. Um, but when we capture that data, um, often we're asking for a single ID number, and so we don't have the ID numbers of every single student. So I just wanted to make sure that I clarified on that. So um, as we continue through our, our efforts to serving the whole child, we're keeping in mind that in order for the, the, you know, to serve the child, to serve our students, we have to help remove barriers, we ha have to help our um, families uh, be connected to services, and um, you know, our hope is to be able to remove those barriers, uh, to connect families to services that then allow parents to be able to also better support their students as well as what we do um, within the school and within the district uh, as well. Um, just as another last point of metric, in terms of the number of hours that we have been open since we have opened uh, since December 15th, 3,427 hours of operation. We will continue to increase our partnerships with our communities and um, we'll com continue to listen to our community and what their needs are and make sure that we're responding and pivoting um, as their needs changes uh, as well. And with that, um, I'm done if you have any questions for me. Thank you, Ben. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have none. Do we have any discussion from the board? Trustee Scout? So, um, yeah, I'm curious about the update on the Wellness Center plan for PV High School. There's been some consternation and concern about displacement and lack of space there, and the fact that it's hard to get, they have obviously have traffic issues. Is there, and I know there was um, some concerns in some meetings, is there an update on that and, and how that can be made better? Or? Yeah, can, so um, one thing I can that answer that, Mr. Slider. Or I can. So will the wellness space at PV High? Yes. Different than the different. wellness center? Yes. Can you explain that? So Wellness Center is a comprehensive uh, facility that allows us to bring all these different community resources and to provide direct and indirect um, services um, like having a food co-op, um, like um, having community action board come in, mm -hmm. providing legal consultation services, um, having Salud para la gente come in. All those Salud para la gente, I, I believe, is also represented at there through our Healthy Start. Um, it is, it's more of a um, one-stop shop of services, whereas at PV High and some of our other sites where they have wellness spaces, it's really about connecting students and supporting their social emotional needs. I, am, am I correct with that? That is correct. Yeah. 
Thank you. Yep. Trustee Dodge Jr. Well, first of all, you know, great work at the Wellness Center. Uh, as the chart shows, people are getting food. Uh, it's a great area where people co op. As everybody knows, 60, 70 percent of the people that attend, those students that attend those schools walk. And so that's always a good thing. And uh, kind of to touch on Trustee Scow's concerns and issues, why at PV and not put it at Rolling Hills where there's more dense population of people and students? Are we talking about wellness spaces or wellness center? I guess, was it the center or? Yeah. I, I was talking about what's being proposed for PV High. I don't know if that's in the scope of this, but, but that is something that we've heard a lot about at PV yeah. High and at some point it would be Maybe at another time. Criteria yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Do we? Yeah, yes. I, I can't uh, answer that. So, okay. Go for it. No, no, no. I said I can't answer that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got you. Yes. So um, PV High, Rolling Hills Middle, and Ansoldo are in an act. They're in a grant. They're in a wellness grant that are written in. So that's the reason why that one that they were chosen for the wellness spaces because they're already doing work with our coordinator of um, counseling services, Chrissy McLean. There is also has been an assessment done at Rolling Hills Middle School. Um, and we are looking that we're moving forward with both Ansoldo and Rolling Hills. Where there is a pause at Pajaro Valley High School because there was um, some feedback that communication did not take place. And so we're working to rectify that situation. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go. Sorry. Any further discussion? Uh, oh, well, no, I just want to thank you, and may, maybe at a future meeting it would be, or in close, when it would be great to get an update about that. Thank you. The PV High. Um, and <laughs> I have a question serpent? about your mental health clinician. Is she bilingual? She is bilingual, yes. That's great. Um, and um, specifically bilingual English-Spanish. Perfect. Yeah. That's what I was hopeful about. And I can't remember my second question, so. Uh, Mr. Sheckman, did you want to add? Something? Yeah, I just want to let the world know. I visited the wellness, the very comprehensive wellness center at EA Hall on Friday afternoon. I came from a district that put money aside over almost 20 years to put wellness centers on every campus, a much smaller number of schools, and the wellness centers was related to more just counseling. What I saw at EA Hall was as comprehensive a wellness center I've ever, ever seen. Three rooms. Parents can come in and they're lost about procedures or registration. They'll get an answer. Families who need food will get food. The clinician in the middle, uh, that middle, what a what a service that we're able to provide our community. She's really good. Nice soft lamps. I felt like hanging around that room and just relaxing. So I commend the planning and the implementation at that one center. It's as good as it gets. And we'll continue, kind of like VAPA, to figure out ways to expand because it's needed everywhere. Thank you, Ben. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. I, Thank you. I appreciate Sorry, it. I remembered my question. So it, when this kicked off, um, we have a partnership with Salud Par La Gente, and they were having trouble staffing the clinic piece, or the right? How is that going now? I think we're still in that place as well. So, you know, I think the ultimate goal was to be able to bring the mobile van over to the wellness center at times, but um, that hasn't happened um, at this point. And, and the challenge was the staffing on that on their end. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for that okay. presentation. Great. Thank you. All right. Moving on to item 10.2, UPK Implementation Plan Update. Casey Klappenbach. All right, good evening once again. President Dr. Holm, Board of Trustees, and Interim Superintendent Mr. Shankman. Um, Shankman, so my apologies. So it, it brings me great pleasure um, and excitement to give us, to provide an update on our UPK implementation plan um, from what we are, to, and I will also review um, our plan really quickly, right, and, and also share our efforts and our next steps that we'll be moving on to this next year. 
So as a reminder, um, our UPK falls under our um, California's theme, right, for state investments. That also um, attaches itself to our ELOP, Universal Mills, Community Schools, and Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiatives all under that whole child, whole family, and whole community piece that our district has also been um, really focused on. And so thinking about the importance of making sure that all of our students have opportunities for early learning programs, right? We know that research has taught us that students that have been having that opportunity and that advantage to participate in preschool gives them improve self-control, right? And so they're able to manage their emotions. They have an advantage in numeracy and literacy. And they also have those long-term effects of most likely graduating from high school and with a college degree. And that goes back to not only the academic piece, but the social emotional piece of being able to have that ability to self-monitor and self-regulate. So, the whole purpose of UPK is really to make sure that all students, especially our historically disadvantaged or marginalized students, have the opportunity so we can make sure and, um, that the gaps do not grow, right, and lead to those achievement gaps. So as you're looking at it, you keep hearing UPK, UPK, UPK. Um, so it really is a term an all-encompassing term for all of these different programs to ensure that our students have early learning opportunities from our state preschool programs to transitional kindergarten to Head Start and the whole goal is that our students have an opportunity for at least a year before they ever enter kindergarten. And so if we're thinking about it, what are a few key things that it offers to our families? Number one, it our, our children are eligible regardless of immigration and income status, right? Making sure that our students have that equity piece. We also want to make sure eventually that all four-year-olds will have free, a free year of education before ever entering kindergarten, which is huge. And it provides a flexibility for our parents to really have those, those choices and options. So they get the choice. And then we also have, um, it really allows us to also stay close with our family and communities and be able to be responsive to their needs. And again, we want to equip all of our students with the tools to succeed in school long term. So taking you back to the timeline, it originated in 2021 20, to 22. And the whole piece of this, as you're looking at it, is all about how students, their birth dates, right? and um, for TK implementation. And so we keep changing the birthday each year. We are allowing er, um, younger and younger students until 20, um, 25 and 26, where it allows, right when kids turn four, year old, four years of age, they get to join us in TK. All right, so it allows districts an implement, a year, five years of implementation as the birthdays um, change. And as we're thinking about it, the big question is, for a parent's point of view, they're thinking, is my child eligible this year for TK? So this shows that if starting in 2023, 2024, the birth date, if they are turning five between September 2nd and April 2nd, they are eligible for TK, right? And so you can see the birthday changes, and it allows them until we get to 2025, 2026, or right when they, you can see September 2nd, and then September 1st, that's the range where a child can just turn four, right? I mean, just turn um, four and be eligible. And so as we're thinking about the plan, we want to make sure that we have five key areas of focus. It's the vision and coherence, community engagement and partnerships, where we want to make sure we're recruiting and training our teachers and our staff and that focus on curriculum instruction and assessment, and of course, our facilities and services and operations. So as we're thinking about that vision and coherence, here is PVUSD's vision. Right here, we wanna make sure that we are offering a robust, inclusive, and culturally responsive 
early childhood experience. And we really want it to make sure that it's aligned PK through third grade. And, um, and so we are moving our students in that, that system work um, with whole child, whole family, and whole community. And so we also, just like when we had contingency planning and in all of our big initiatives, we have guiding principles that drive um, the whole process and development of the plan. So when we're making decisions, we go back to our guiding principles and we're like, all right, does it, does it fit? Oh no, so we're not, it's not gonna veer us off. We're gonna make decisions based on our guiding principles throughout um, the implementation. And so here in PVUSD, you see that we have um, a variety of models where we've implemented um, our TK programs. You might see TK offering being offered with the possibility of expansion to all. That means right now we have them at 10 sites. And so our goal as we survey our communities and schools, if the need is there, then we are, we are adding additional classes. We, you might find a TK and K combination class at some of our sites. Our goal is always not to. Our goal is to really just offer a straight TK, but you will find because of numbers that we might have a combo there. Um, right now, we also have our state preschool programs. And this is really great because we may have a state preschool program in the afternoon, and we may have TK students being able to attend a TK class and then go to an afternoon state preschool class. Um, and we might also see a CSPP, which is state preschool, right? A standalone program too, as long as our families meet the eligibility. And then we also have our robust Head Start and Migrant Seasonal Head Start standalone programs as well. And so looking at all the variety of programs we offer for early childhood, you can see we have part day and full day programs and the different sites and age groups. So we actually have care starting at two months, right? As you can see in Migrant Seasonal Head Start and our child development um, department too with state preschool, you can see that we do have some programs starting when they're really, really young. And then we also have um, our special services and, and SELPA piece at Duncan Holbert. We have our adult education program also and migrant education as well. So it's a robust system. So this is our actual implementation plan that was presented last year, taking in the demographics and numbers um, enrollment numbers at each of the um, lo locations and communities. Um, we had slated for this year to add Landmark and Bradley, but looking at the numbers in the area, we, were, we actually moved Landmark to next year because we know um, we did not, we would probably not have enough students to fill those classrooms. So looking at where students were already enrolling in TK last year, we saw that Bradley, um, had that need. So we were able to expand to Bradley for this upcoming school year. And as numbers continue and projections come in, we will continue to add. And this is our implementation piece as long as we have the students. And so it takes many departments to lift this work. And so you can see we have our ECE department, uh, Migrant Seasonal Head Start, Special Education, Elementary Education, and multi-departmental um, with our P3 collaboration this year. And so how, how did we continue this year to um, engage with our community partners? We increased the number of ECE and Migrant Seasonal Head Start parent meetings. We also participated in the UPK County town hall sessions with First Five. Um, we worked with, um, we're currently working with the grantor um, to expand Migrant Seasonal Head Start services. And then also we facilitated two of our own PVUSD UPK town hall um, sessions for our parents to make sure we're enrolling them in the right program and getting them right then and there to make sure they understand their opportunities. And so we also had that al alignment with our, with Ms. Littleton Bruno and the ELOP efforts. So we were able to offer a nine hour day. That means even at the sites where we had half day TK, we were able to also provide access to um, 
expanded learning opportunities for a nine hour day if, the, if that's what the parent needed. And then these are just a few ways we were able to do it across the district. And so this year, it's evolved even more. So it'll look a little different. So when you're looking at um, our big group of schools, right, where you're looking under expanding learning after school program ran by our PVUSD ELOP, you see that big group of schools. All the parents need to do is fill out the expanded learning application online or at the site. Then at Bradley, Calabasas, and Landmark, we are partnering with our ECE program. And so our TK students are able to, if they qualify, to actually enroll in state preschool after school. All right. And then when you're looking at the rest of our sites over there with Mar Vista and Valencia, we have community partners for the after school program there. So our parents have that um, that opportunity. So the half day programs are supported as well as full day programs. We have really worked on trying to increase our workforce that are trained with ECE units. So we have been able to pay for some of our IAs and current elementary school teachers to obtain their ECE units um, through Cabrillo. And so we will continue to offer that for them to make sure that they are prepared for our younger students, um, as well as if teachers want to retake some of the courses that, that they had a long time ago and continue to grow. And so that we also have additional money in our EETD grant that will continue that work as well. And this next slide just demonstrates some of the professional learning sessions that were offered this year um, we ha um, to our TK teachers um, and many of our ECE as well as Migrant Seasonal Head Start teachers. So we had anti-bias training, we had some of our inclusive practice strategies, um, and our introduction to teaching pyramid which really focuses on SEL um, with our youngest students. As we're looking at this next year for curriculum and instruction, this last year we actually did a pilot um, with our Bridges program for TK, which is our math program for the rest of elementary. And so they will be implementing that program and they will have a complete um, math program this year. We will also be um, offering two full day TK sites that are implementing, just like our full day kindergarten sites, the Hegarty, which focuses on phonological awareness, early literacy, early literacy skills. And so moving on to facilities. So this year, TK is expanding to Bradley Elementary. We were able to use um, additional space that was a, was used in the past for preschool. And we also were also um, able to um, really support the room environment in TK at Minty White to make sure that they their learning environment matched our PVUSD guided principles, guiding principles. We will continue to do that work also with the other sites. And then <clears throat> if what we have done is we've really looked at the needs of our parents, they need full day preschool. So what we found is we have a couple sites that have had low enrollment with half day programs. Um, the CDD department, Lisa Sandoval, has been asking for the state to approve a full day preschool instead of a half day site because our parents need that. And then you're probably wondering, and a lot of our parents keep asking, do they have to go to TK? No, it is just one of the options and it is actually a free option for them. Right? And so they, it's all about parent choice. We want to make sure we are offering and meeting the needs of our parents in our community. And so, for those of you parents who are watching tonight, hopefully you can see that there are different ways to enroll. So if you're looking to enroll um, for TK, there is the link right there on the screen for you. If you're looking at how to enroll in state preschool, there it is, and we also have our phone number to reach out to Migrant and Seasonal Head Start programs. And so as we are so proud of our community of educators and team, early learning team working together, um, we do have a 
brief little commercial to make sure that all of our parents and family and community knows how worthwhile our early learning program in TK and full day kindergarten are being offered here. Is your child ready to embark on an exciting journey of learning and growth? At BBUSD, we offer transitional kinder and kindergarten with dedicated staff, which includes before and after school programming available all day. From building friendships to exploring the wonders of science to music and garden education, PBUSD's innovative curriculum sparks imagination. Your child will develop essential skills like critical thinking, problem solving, and creativity, setting them up for a lifetime of achievement. Your child's educational journey begins at PVUSD. All right, so you can see um, we have worthwhile programs and parents and families, please make sure you come down and enroll in PVUSD. Oh. Thank, you, thank you. Are there any public speakers to this item? We have none. Is that commercial available in Spanish as well? Yes, it is. There's Alicia. It is in Spanish also. Wonderful. Um, any other board? Dis uh, it, the presentation was wonderful. Thank you. Any other board? Uh, Trustee Dodge Jr. Thank you for what you've done to make it really successful in a bigger program at Mini White. Um, I, I know. It, w it was hard for parents to send their kids, you know, for only a couple hours a day, but you pushing the program to make it all day, you know, it, it's a big help. In my district, in the city of Watsonville, I just wanted to say thank you very much for making that happen. So I do want to give all the credit to our team and especially our classroom teachers too, and we worked with um, PVFT. Radhika and Nelly were part of that um, work and making sure that we set it up and planned it out all together. So, yep, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Hey, Trustee Flores? Uh, thank you for that. It was very informative. I actually was just approached this week by a parent um, a, a, in the Pajaro community who has a three-year-old. And she was asking, you know, where do I go? Do I just go to the tower? Do I, you know, so this, was, this is perfect. I'm going to show her this, show her that last slide where it says exactly how, you know, who she needs to call. So thank you. And just for any other parents, we have um, developed a trifold with all of our um, programs that we offer. The team has put it together in Spanish and English, the eligibility requirements, and we will be sending them to sites and then also training staff to be able to help parents navigate so they're not getting a no over here when they just didn't meet an eligibility requirement and they're trying to go all over town to find a spot for their child. Vice President Acosta? I have just a quick question, Casey. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to the video, um, where is access that families can get that? Is it going to be on our district's website? It will be is on it, our district website. Because that's not live in the board docs, right? No, no. it isn't. No. Um, but they should be able to. We will make sure we have it on our website if we don't. But they will actually be able to see it on TV. And Alicia actually should be able to tell us the exact channels it, it would be airing on. Okay, thank you for that. No problem. Thank you for a wonderful last presentation. Yes. Thanks. Anyone else? Uh, Trustee DeSerpa? Um, so if we're expanding to Bradley, does that mean we have a lot of TK children? Like, is our enrollment in increasing and that's why we're expanding? Yes, yeah, so we were able to. So what we looked at is where were our students heavily trying to get into and weren't a, like where were they attending but couldn't get into their neighborhood school for TK right and so we had a lot of Bradley parents trying to enroll or enrolled in Valencia or Mar Vista so it made sense when we were looking at where the parents were coming that we saw a need to expand out to Bradley and sure enough we have a full now now our ratio is actually 20 to 1 Right or 20 to 2 so we actually have 20 students in most of in seven out of our 10 classrooms for TK right now are completely full All right. Well way to end it on a high note Casey yep. Bravo right. Thank you, and if you give me just a second I um, Superintendent mr. Sheckman took me off guard a little bit when he um, said those kind words and gave me flowers so I did just want to say thank you so much 
he has um, really taken the helm, and we have appreciated his leadership, and also for your relentless um, support. I truly appreciate it, um, and for the honor of being able to serve the families, the students, and the fellow educators of um, PVUSD. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to go on to our consent agenda. Um, do we have any public speakers to the consent agenda? We have none. Are there any items that the board wishes to defer? Yes, Trustee. Um, can I just pull 11.4? 11.4. OK. So um, any other items? OK, so is that a motion to approve the consent agenda items with the exception of 11.4? All right. Do we have a second? I'll second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. So moving on to item, the deferred consent agenda is what is 11.4? Uh, if I can comment? Sure. OK. Uh, I just want to say thank you to Driscoll's for donating $150,000 for letting Watsonville High School upgrade their field to a soccer field. I'm not sure the CEO of Driscoll's, but I just wanted to say thank you to them for, you know, not having to match, just giving directly $150,000 to help us um, upgrade a soccer field. As I mentioned earlier, soccer is very important in our community. And I also would just like to say Luis Guerrero for, um, working with our Lindo, um, uh, Dr. Clara Fernandez and Gregorio. And I just wanted to personally say thank you for everybody making this happen. And hopefully companies can continue to give, not just to Watson, Ohio, but to any other schools in the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. So thank you very much. Would you like to move to approve? I'd like to make a motion to approve agenda item 11.4. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. All right, um, going on to item 14.1, action report on closed session. Are there any items to report from closed session? Uh, yes, we do have some items. Um, I, um, on closed session item 2.1, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on July 26, 2023 with eight and 11 additional action items and I'll need a second for that. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> Motion carries 7-0. And on closed session item 2.2, .2, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on July 26, 2023 with eight and 15 additional action items. And I need a second. Yeah. All we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. And those are our only items to report out of closed session. Great. So our next meeting is, in fact, a special board meeting on August 9th. And this meeting is adjourned at 1051. Yeah.